Good morning, everybody. Welcome to day two of the Apalachicola Cola NER Research Symposium. Uh, we're going to start off just a little bit slow. We have a bunch of people joining all at once, and so we'll let them get uh, on the webinar and, and get situated. We have another packed day of presentations. Uh, I hope, as all of you, um, I was very excited and, and interested to hear about all of the research that was going on um, yesterday. A lot of great presentations, a lot of information. So first, I'd like to thank everybody that presented yesterday. Again, thank you so much uh, for kicking us off and, and having a, a, a very successful first day of the symposium. I'd like to start with a few housekeeping items. As you can see on the slide, uh, the symposium is being recorded and those recordings will be provided to all of the regist registrant registrants uh, after uh, we complete today. If you have a question during the day, uh, you can do two things. One is you can raise your hand. You can use the raise hand button. And uh, we'll show you this um, on a slide in just a second. The other option is you can uh, enter your question into the questions box. And uh, Kennedy, if you want to switch over, we'll show you a little more information of what that looks like. It's just a little bit confusing in WebEx, so just to help you guys out. Um, so if you should see the questions drop down uh, box, uh, click on the question triangle, type your question, and most importantly, hit send. And then your question will come to us as the organizers. And uh, when the presentation is completed, uh, we'll make sure that that question um, goes to the presenter or to somebody else that um, may be part of the webinar. Um, and we will also be monitoring the questions box if you have a particular question about, um, about the webinar or if you're having difficulties connecting. Uh, with the raise hand function, uh, it's over on the right side. You should see the little up hand. And if you click on that, we will see that and uh, we'll call on you and take you off mute. And then you can ask your question to the presenter. In addition to uh, live question and answer, uh, we also have the Padlet. And uh, the Padlet, uh, we gave you the link yesterday during the webinar, but uh, this morning you will have, you would have also received an email from Kennedy Hansen. And within that email, there's more information about connecting to the Padlet. There's the agenda for today. And uh, there are their bios for all the speakers. And lastly, uh, during this afternoon, we will have a breakout session and there's information about joining that breakout session. So to give you a brief overview of today's presentations, uh, we will hear about coastal processes, restoration, hydrology, including the river, the floodplain and the bay. Uh, Necton and food web dynamics. And then lastly, the two breakout sessions will be climate change and sea level rise. And the second one will be listed species and coastal habitats. So I hope you're all excited to, to get started and, uh, and hear about all the great things going on in Apalachicola Bay. So with that, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, although Chris Kincaid pointed out yesterday that uh, kickoff is maybe a, a better uh, description. Uh, this morning, I'm very pleased to uh, have Adam Blay Blaylock, who is our deputy secretary for the, uh, for the Division of Water Policy and Ecosystems Restoration. 
which is over the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection, uh, which uh, all of the, the NERS in Florida are within. And um, Adam started just a little over a year ago. And unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, we've been unable to have him visit us. And uh, I know that was that was the plan maybe a year ago. So um, I'm hoping that that's still on his his docket. That that's something that he's interested in. And uh, I've made all sorts of so, uh, promises to have him on the boat and take him out to the island and and see all of uh, the different things that we do here at the reserve. And uh, today, uh, Adam will be talking about the value of research and monitoring. Uh, specifically to DEP, but also to better understanding our managed lands and waters. So with that, Adam, I can, I see a block, but we can't see you. Well, I'm sorry you. about that. No, and yeah, your, uh, your sentiment was definitely uh, really hoping um, in the near future to be able to come out to the aquatic preserve and not just uh, Apalachicola, but all the uh, others around the state, the, uh, they all play a really important part of the state's uh, ecology and ecosystems and really do an excellent job in research and uh, education and so forth. So I'm uh, happy to be here um, and thank you for inviting me to come and give a little bit of uh, discussion about the Apalachicola and Air. Um, you know, I think it's really is a remarkable part of our state from the bay and Apalachicola River, the barrier islands and the salt marshes, and it really provides a diverse uh, ecosystem and supporting of a very diverse wildlife. Um, and I think it's, you know, the challenges are also there from, you know, nutrient issues and salinity issues and now uh, you know a lot of attention being put on impacts of sea level rise and how sea level rise is impacting our uh, ecosystems such as Apalachicola Bay uh, and so I'm really excited to see kind of some of the discussion today and I looked and was able to see some of yesterday uh, and I think having this uh, symposium kind of focusing on these issues and the research going on to identify cause <clears throat> and solutions as well. Um, I know for today, seeing the discussion on uh, the East River and impacts to East Bay, uh, something that I was really interested to be able to hear about later. Um, I know last session, there was discussion from some of the local representatives there on you know, the changes in salinity that they're seeing in Lake Wimico and the, some of the additional funding that went to providing monitoring um, in collaboration with the Apalachicola Aquatic Preserve near and Northwest Florida Water Management District to put in additional monitoring systems to be able to identify some of the causes of um, those impacts and you know, outside of that, you know, the land use changes and increase in nutrient levels and what those impacts that we're seeing and what we can do to prevent that and try to bring back some of the uh, impacts that have been occurring. Uh, the legislature last year funded uh, $25 million that included specific uh, appropriations to the Apalachicola River, uh, along with the St. John's River and Swanee River. And we identified a handful of projects specific to the Apalachicola River, primarily looking at increasing uh, septic to sewer projects and upgrading wastewater facilities in the surrounding communities to try to do some Part and reducing nutrients going into the ecosystem and continuing with that uh, next year as we look at additional funding uh, to go into that area. Um, I think the sea level rise and resiliency coming up this year and this session is going to be really uh, important and allow us to be able to you know look 
more closely and at sea level rise and what those impacts are and what we can do to put funding towards reducing some of the uh, impacts that we see from sea level rise and uh, you know I think the areas like Apalachicola Bay you know they can provide a big natural uh, barrier I guess so to speak maybe not the best word but uh, to you know prevent some of um, impacts from sea level rise and so seeing how that program is laid out is going to be a really uh, big part of this session um, the I think one of the other you know big issues that are currently going on with the litigation from the ACF I guess probably one of the longest ongoing uh, environmental court cases uh, on Monday will be a big page in that uh, uh, book as we have oral arguments in front of the U.S. Supreme Court uh, and seeing what that outcome may be to try to bring better freshwater flows into the bay and reducing those impacts that we've seen uh, to our oyster industry and uh, the ecosystem in the bay. And so I've, you know, there's a lot of focus on Apalachicola River and Apalachicola Bay and uh, DEP as a whole doing what we can to try to help with those issues that are ongoing and collaborating with the water management districts and DAX and our federal partners uh, will go a long way into trying to identify and then uh, provide solutions. And so I'm just very uh, happy that this symposium is going on and getting a lot of the people who are going to be directly uh, responsible in identifying the issues and providing those solutions and so uh, I'm excited about getting to uh, participate in the symposium today and I'll be kind of on and off throughout the day uh, but I'm really excited to hear the conversation and discuss uh, some of these issues and again I just am uh, thankful to be invited to come and speak and I really am looking forward to getting out there in the near future. Uh, as Jenna said, it was something at the very beginning. I went to GTM and was kind of planning to go from there to visit the other uh, nears and aquatic preserves and unfortunately COVID had kind of put in a uh, stop to that but I feel like that's something that I'm going to be able to get back to doing uh, here in the near future. And so I'm, with that, I kick it back over to uh, Jenna. If anybody has any questions or anything, I'm happy to answer. And, you know, I'm just excited to uh, start with the uh, symposium and uh, be able to listen to the discussion and learn more about all the issues that are ongoing and the science and research and data collection that everybody uh, that are on this call are, are doing. So thank you again. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And sorry again for my uh, camera not working. No, thank you so much, Adam. And, and no worries, uh, as we've seen yesterday and on many of these webinars, there's always uh, gremlins lurking <laughs> around every corner. So um, no, we're just, uh, very excited and, and pleased to, to have you uh, speak this morning and, and thank you for touching on uh, many of the, uh, the items and concerns that I think a, a lot of the audience um, has about, um, you know, the, the ongoing challenges with Apalachicola Bay and, and um, you know, some of the issues that we face here. And um, yeah, a great introduction to some of, some of the talks today as well. And, um, I was gonna see, uh, Josh, do we have any questions for Adam while we have him? I am not seeing anything pop up in the question box or nothing on the Padlet currently. Um, give it a second or two if anybody's typing anything feverishly. But uh, yeah, right now we, we are good. 
or if anyone wants to raise their hand, we can take you off mute and you can ask your question. We've got a shy crowd this morning, Adam. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would like to ask, I'll put you on the spot. Um, I've seen over the last few years how uh, res funding for resilience has has really um, multiplied uh, through the department. And so um, I don't know if you can speak to maybe um, some of uh, some of the items that are kind of floating around the legislature right now um, towards um, building a more resilient Florida. Oh, uh, did you hear my question? I did not. I'm sorry. Can you, I hear you now, though. Oh, no problem. Um, I just, uh, we, we didn't have any other questions. And so I had a quick question or a comment. Um, just over the last few years, we've seen um, funding through DEP to support uh, uh, planning within our local communities uh, for resilience to uh, sea level rise. And um, we, we, we see that that may be multiplying and developing more this year uh, through the legislature. And I wonder if you just touch on that on the, on that briefly, please. Yeah, yeah, uh, and the Resilient Florida program, you know, we're really excited about it and it's kind of in its infancy as we're looking at how that is gonna be implemented. But yeah, a lot of focus being, at least initially on having local governments, counties and coastal municipalities uh, coming in and doing vulnerability assessments kind of above and beyond kind of their typical peril of flood analysis so that they can provide to the state a good assessment of you know, potential impacts of sea level rise on their communities and so and then by having those submitted to DEP and being able to then um, take all of those and provide a kind of statewide uh, resiliency vulnerability assessment is I think a really good first step and then being able to from there identify you know projects and things that can be done to um, counter those impacts that are uh, going to be seen so yeah I think after uh, uh, knock on wood that the legislature uh, adopts and uh, is able to uh, provide the uh, needed funding uh, that the governor has proposed in his budget it's i think going to go a long way to really kind of having florida establish that um, those assessments and so you know something that we're really excited about i know alex um, reed definitely uh excited about and um, it's gonna i think be a really good thing so thank you so much uh maybe one more last check with josh any questions yeah, uh, Rick, did you uh, have something that you wanted to add? Uh, sure, yeah. So first of all, excellent uh, symposium so far. I uh, enjoyed uh, presentations yesterday. I had to step out for a few, but I look forward to going back and seeing those recorded. Um, but before we get started today, I uh, wanted to see if you could give us Oh, just a, a summary, um, and I, I came in about two minutes late starting, maybe did this already, but a summary of uh, who all has been participating in this, generally, you know, roughly how many people, what types of uh, organizations or fields uh, of folks. I'm sorry, for the symposium? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I, um, I'm, I may say thank you to Adam and let you off the hook <laughs> if we have no questions for Adam. And um, yeah, happy to, to answer that, Rick. Um, so the symposium uh, is really just a sprinkling of, of the different, um, different partners that the, the NER has. And uh, uh, all of our, our local agencies are represented. Uh, so uh, from fisheries and, and species, uh, species monitoring habitats uh, from FWC, um, our local uh, aquaculture uh, from DAX, uh, aquaculture uh, division, uh, water management district, 
uh, from federal agencies, of course, NOAA and uh, USGS and um, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. You'll hear from some of those folks this afternoon. And then many of our university partners and um, uh, runs the gamut today. I gave a big long list to Adam and um, it, a whole bunch. So we've got FSU, FAMU, uh, University of Central Florida, University of Florida, uh, Auburn University, you'll hear from this morning. Uh, um, we got uh, TAMU, Corpus Christ Christi, we have um, Mississippi, Mississippi State University, uh, Louisiana State University. Uh, I'm forgetting a whole bunch, but uh, it, it's, it's, amazing i mean this is um, um personally i this is one of the most exciting things about working at the research reserve is building all these partnerships and um and i would be remiss to, uh, I'm, I'm missing ngos uh, audubon and uh, the nature conservancy and um you know we've got folks like you that are consultants and uh the regional planning council and uh i i'm definitely missing a whole bunch but um yeah, it's it's very exciting to see all the different partners. That's and, great. Um, it, it, yeah. that, it's really amazing uh, the amount of work, obviously, that went into this uh, to be able to pull this many folks together. Uh, so, roughly, like, how many people would you say uh, are are part of the the audience? I guess I would describe it as. Mm -hmm. Um, we're somewhere between about seventy and a hundred people are uh, for the audience. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have the, uh, the staff and the, the panelists uh, in addition to that. So, uh, yeah, very happy to to have everybody join us. And and um, again, it's it's a, a smattering of all those different um, agencies and universities and partners and um, kind of secondary uh, to just sharing the information is. Um, trying to encourage folks to collaborate. And if they see something they're excited about that they're interested in, in learning more about or, or being a research partner, uh, we're really hoping that people will connect um, either um, verbally by asking questions during the symposium or, or um, follow up on the Padlet. Um, it's a great way to just you know send somebody a message and say, hey, I'd like to, to learn more about this or I'd like to talk with you more. Sure. Well, I can assure you that that uh, one is is a success because uh, there are certainly some great uh, folks that we listened to yesterday that we're looking forward to coordinating with. Excellent. Thanks so much, Rick. Thank you. All right. Now, don't disappear. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's uh, the end of the questions. Um, uh, I'll let you uh, take it off. All right. So oh, I'm serious, Rick. You got to come back on camera. You're up next, and uh, and, uh, and I know jo Josh is out there too. Hey, Josh. Yep. So uh, Josh is going to to get us started, and then uh, and then toss the ball to me to run with. Okay. So real quick, I'd like to introduce Rick Harder from WSP USA and Josh Adams from the Appalachian Regional Planning Council. And guys, I'll let you take it away. Thanks so much. Hey, uh, thank you, really appreciate it. Um, so I'm just gonna give a brief introduction of uh, uh, ARPC, um, kind of what we do, and then uh, get into um, kind of the background up into uh, data collection for our Franklin 98 project, and then I'll turn it over to uh, Rick Harder here. but. Um, Appalachian Regional Planning Council, um, we're the uh, planning council that serves the kind of central uh, eastern panhandle area. We provide uh, different services to our constituent counties and municipalities. And uh, one of the more exciting projects, um, a little bit biased, I'm the environmental planner, so the uh, most exciting project to me that we've been working on is the Franklin 98 project. Um, uh, tagline is uh, protecting the community conserving the coast. And it started uh, a few years ago. There you go. All right. Uh, there we go. Yeah, I clicked in a left arrow or right arrow also. But uh, so uh, yeah, we're going to give you a, a 
a background, a, a, a brief summary, um, kind of our uh, data collection efforts to date, uh, an update on some of the different test materials that we've been using. So the, the project aims to create a fringe marsh and some hard bottom reefs. So we'll give you a little bit of uh, uh, an update on the uh, different materials that we've been uh, considering and how those have fed into our design considerations. We're um, at a point to where we're um, going to be turning in our uh, permits to DEP and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, so we'll give you a little update on our conceptual designs and, and talk about it a little bit. And then we would love to hear some, some feedback from uh, the audience about um, things that we might consider going forward, what we might be able to do differently, and um, uh, just hear hear different perspectives from the audience. So the top left square is uh, our project area. So it's 12 miles and it stretches from East Point Breakwater all the way to about McKissick Beach uh, in Carabell. So it's 12 miles, but the um, uh, the project, when it's at completion, will not be 12 contiguous miles. There'll be you know, some reef and marsh uh, scattered about uh, the project area. And so uh, the, the top right uh, square here, we saw some, um, uh, provides us some anecdotal evidence, or not anecdotal, but uh, actually empirical evidence that if we have a structure that's able to attenuate wave energy. Uh, so this section of the coast uh, coastline, um, uh, uh, we don't see a lot of docks out there, but so this was an instance where the docks and these uh, pilings were able to attenuate enough wave energy to allow the establishment of a uh, marsh, so uh, Spartina here. And then behind it, you see that there's a bunch of uh, 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 sediments that have been trapped by uh, the rhizomes there of the of the grass, and so um, this was kind of stood out and provided us kind of like the hey, you know, if we were able to um, you know create these types of habitat, attenuate enough wave energy, kind of plant a fringe marsh, that we would be able to uh, get some success. And so this picture was taken following Hurricane um, Michael, and um, even after. You know, a lot of the, the washout um, of the road and riprap, and you can see kind of the corrugated concrete behind it, uh, the, uh, the, the, the marsh and that sediment was still left in place. So uh, while certainly this isn't going to preempt the need for seawalls, um, you know, along the stretch of the highway here, it certainly will help with the day-to-day -day erosion and provide the, uh, the needed habitat um, for different marine life. Uh, in and along our area. So we started with a, um, uh, we did a, a number of tabletop exercises where we invited the public out. I think that we had a, at least eight public meetings uh, in total uh, where we had good participation. We used uh, large maps and had folks provide comments via sticky notes that we incorporated in, into um, our, uh, we had a, um, uh, a GIS web-based map where we we map feedback and are considering that in our design. Um, there was also, um, uh, you notice on the bottom right, uh, this is some uh, wave height uh, statistics for uh, different storm uh, characteris uh, characteris characteristics there. Um, so that just gives us a better idea of how big the, the waves might be under different storm categories. Um, so we've uh, done a lot of background uh, modeling and, and, and research uh, prior to uh, looking at um, the, um, uh, you know, before um, beginning to actually start the project. So for about a year and a half, we um, did a lot of public involvement and even prior to that we had a, a, a GIS project where we looked at uh, what areas would benefit the most for shoreline restoration work. So um, those areas that already had a marsh um, obviously would make sense to, uh, to do restoration efforts there but where there was no marsh, where there was substantial um, uh, infrastructure, 
where there uh, were homes, uh, were roadways, uh, those were all um, the highest priority areas and the one that stood out the most, there was a few segments, but they were all along this Highway 98 stretch in between East Point and Tate's Hill here uh, within this uh, bounded box. And um, the box does go um, onto uh, dry land there, but the project is going to be all about uh, mean high water and, and below. Um, so it's uh, not going to uh, go too much onto the right of way there. Uh, so, you know, how should your shoreline, um, you know, how how green or how gray might it be? So right now, if uh, we we see a lot of revetment, um, it is how you could characterize the uh, the coastline uh, right now. Um, and there are certainly breakwaters uh, near East Point. Uh, but what we're looking at is kind of a, a mix between uh, the sills, um, whoops, um, let's try to go backwards here. Uh, what we're trying to do is get a, uh, a kind of a mix between uh, the sills and uh, the, the breakwater, but we're not uh, going to be, uh, we're, you know, we're not interested in creating a, a long linear structure like most breakwaters. We want to see, and we'll, uh, we have some slides later on in the presentation that, that highlight this, is we want a really uh, amorphous design, something that looks more, uh, akin to a natural oyster bar, uh, kind of uh, like a, if you're looking at it from above, almost like an amoeba or um, uh, you know something that is is just not a line. And if you're looking at it from the road or uh, from the air, uh, it, that we you know, the ultimate goal would be to um, for it to look as natural as possible. So I uh, mentioned that we had got um, a, a number of different comments um, in doing our uh, public outreach, and we uh, characterized the data into kind of three different categories, general interest, uh, caution areas, areas to avoid. Um, for instance, uh, like that's where um, uh, folks like to, uh, where there's sandy areas, um, where people want to uh, see those remain that way. Uh, versus a, a vegetated shoreline and just a, a little bit more background information that was provided. Um, so we got good information on uh, erosional hotspots. So where there's those repetitive washouts. So we're uh, attuned to those areas that um, uh, could really benefit from uh, some shoreline stabilization with the use of the the, the marsh as well as our hard bottom reefs. Um, uh, it, this is, uh, if you've ever been in this area, you might have uh, fished it. Um, so I'm a fisherman, I'm uh, a little bit biased, but um, it was also important that we don't uh, interfere with the public's ability to access the shoreline and be able to uh, fish from the shore. Um, so that was uh, really important also. And then um, also in considering the design, um, you know, doing so in such a way that provides habitat to different birds, also oyster catchers, for instance. Um, I learned a lot about the uh, kind of specific height that they like, and um, we'll certainly consider that um, where we're able to. And so the vision and goal for uh, the Franklin 98 project is to provide a mosaic of habitats. So uh, different fringe habitats provide uh, better uh, uh, ecosystem for all the different um, uh, invertebrates, uh, uh, vertebrates, um, all of them. So with a, a mix of habitat types, those ecotones will be able to um, uh, design uh, better for all of them than if we were just to have one habitat type across. And so we're also partnering with uh, uh, Franklin County School, where um, uh, if, you, if anyone knows uh, Joe Taylor and his group, shout out to them. They've been instrumental in helping us uh, get volunteers and um, drumming up support for the project. Uh, Franklin's Promise Corps and uh, part of the uh, AmeriCorps there. Um, but so kind of the, what are the biggest challenges and constraints for the project is uh, 
We do want to uh, maintain some unvegetated areas for shorebirds also. Um, so uh, a lot of times the uh, loafing shoreboard birds like a, a really flat, uh, unvegetated area. And if you know we're trying to create uh, seagrass and um, uh, marsh out there, that that wouldn't necessarily be good for them. Um, but at the same time, we do um, our our goal is to create a uh, as much of that as possible for the uh, for for the other uh, critters and for the um, you know, offsetting some erosion out there. Um, and then later on, we might want to um, look at how we might better uh, protect the road from a safety standpoint so where it doesn't interfere with the view of the road and uh, kind of like I mentioned a little bit earlier, maintain some open areas for cast netting and gigging. And uh, just one more slide for me before I turn it over to Rick. So our uh, our goal is to create about 20 acres of uh, new reef, hard bottom reef, and the bottom right slide kind of highlights that amorphous uh, uh, amoeb amoebic area uh, rather than those straight linear reefs. And then on the back end of that, uh, once those uh, reefs have been in place for some time and the uh, the, the, the wave environment, the uh, littoral drift is able to kind of go back to equilibrium, stabilize a little bit. We're then going to backfill that, not backfill it. We're not doing it. Uh, we're not doing that, but we are going to uh, then place uh, marsh uh, plantings behind uh, where those uh, re um, uh, reef structures are. So once they've attenuated wave energy, stabilize the shoreline, we'll then uh, go back in and plant Spartina behind it. And so what are we looking to, to, to get out of this project? Increased ecosystem productivity and diversity is the, as the primary goal. And then that will lead to shoreline stabilization, increase uh, some community resiliency. We're hoping less downtime for the road. Um, and um, we really wanna get good community education and cooperation. Uh, we want the locals to really uh, take and embrace the project and uh, get as much feedback as we can early on so that we're uh, attuned to uh, what what it is that Franklin County, what East Point, what Carabelle wants to, to see out of this project, and then to uh, kind of uh, also boost a little bit of economic development, maybe have a better fishery for people to, to visit and to be able to recreate. In. And with that, I'll turn it over uh, to Rick to kind of uh, Give us an idea of the uh, next phases that we're going to be operating under and a little bit of background on uh, some of the design considerations and uh, where we're where we're going all right thanks josh um hope everybody can hear me it looks like i'm off mute so uh the first phase of the project was uh it is complete it was funded under a uh, grant from the florida department of environmental protection uh, that funded the, the first round of stakeholder meetings interagency meetings uh coastal conditions analysis and uh, a number of other things uh, we're now in uh phases two and three uh, both of which are funded by the national fish and wildlife foundation uh, through two different grants. One is the Emergency Coastal Resilience Fund, uh, and the other is the Gulf Environmental Benefit Fund, which is um, associated with Deepwater Horizon uh, restoration. And there we go. Okay, so uh, over the last maybe six or seven, eight months, maybe, uh, we've been busy collecting a lot of uh, site data for that study area, the 12 mile stretch of shoreline. Uh, some of the things that we've done are uh, bathymetric or elevation uh, surveys. We've used uh, a number of different tools for that. Uh, we actually flew two rounds of LIDAR. Um, we did aerial photography, both with uh, manned aircraft and drones. Um, and we collected sediments along the project area. Uh, collected some hydrodynamic data with uh, some low-cost wave gauges that Nigel Temple uh, helped develop. Uh, we also put out an acoustic Doppler current profiler, or ADCP, um, and uh, did a, a couple of rounds of avian surveys. So uh, a lot of a lot of uh, background data collection to help us inform the design. 
And as part of that first phase of uh, the project that was funded by DEP, uh, we wanted to get some materials out into the water just to get a, a, a qualitative idea of what types of uh, materials we're going to do well in terms of recruitment uh, and stability. There's, there's a new product out there that uh, we found interesting. It's a uh, jute material that is uh, impregnated with uh, Portland Cement. Uh, it's called Oyster Catcher. Um, it's from a company called Sandbar Oyster Company in North Carolina. And they can form this into all sorts of different shapes. So uh, we took uh, two different um, configurations of that and put it out. We wanted to see how well it would stand up in terms of uh, uh, stability from wave energy. We also wanted to see like was there enough colonization that if you just inserted these into the bottom of the bay like this picture shows, would they essentially grow together with oysters uh, if the colonization is, is fast enough? Uh, and we also had some plastic milk crates that we put limestone, uh, granite, and oyster shell in uh, just as a comparison. Uh, we put it out really at a time of year when the um, Recruitment is very low for oysters, but the barnacles love it. So uh, really, we got tons of barnacles uh, starting off um, as of last. Well, th this past fall was pretty good spat set, uh, and we have quite a few uh, oysters growing on them now. Here are some pictures of some of the materials from the milk crates. I see oyster shells. Um, I think the top right is granite, and I think the bottom left is limestone. But one of the things that's obvious is the tops of the materials uh, don't have a lot of oysters. Um, we believe that's primarily due to uh, both predation uh, and the fact that the oyster larvae like to uh, settle in a dark area. So they go up underneath the rocks or shells. Um, we also are seeing pretty good oyster colonization on the, the materials we put out. These things that have the loop on them. Uh, they call those lollipops, uh, the same type of material um, that doesn't have those. They call those rastas because it looks like a, uh, a lot of dreadlocks. And so I'm sure everybody is, is uh, who's been out on the coast and, and paid attention to where oysters are growing. Uh, you know, there's this sweet spot zone in the water column. They, they uh, they seem to have, like if you look at a dock piling, you'll see a cluster of oysters right around uh, mean water level. You go too high and that's too dry for them. Uh, you go too low and then they taper off. So uh, we wanted to quantify what is that sweet spot. Uh, so we've, we've used a RTK GPS and have been collecting data on that. Uh, and that's helping to drive uh, our design of, for the top of the oyster reefs. Uh, another another configuration of that same oyster catcher material, they call these tabletops. It looks like a, a little maybe you know, two foot by two foot patio table that you might have, you might set a plant on or something. This is actually two of them. They're stacked on top of each other. Um, this was the day that they were put out. So they weren't even wet yet. So it's very white. Uh, it's basically looks the same as the, uh, the Rastas and the lollipops now. Uh, all of them have pretty good coverage of small oysters, um, eager to see how they survive into uh, next year. Um, but one of the things that was clear to us is on these, uh, the rastas and the lollipops, there's not, a, well, there's a lot of predation uh, that, that is clearly occurring uh, and not a lot of colonization, uh, except in areas where there are, are some interstitial spaces that provide some refuge. Uh, so this tabletop design uh, appeals to us because uh, each tabletop has a lot of interstitial space. And when you stack them together, it provides some refuge there. So, um, you know, that's that's one of the things that we're considering as uh, potential reef materials. Uh, we also have been collecting some uh, reference information on uh, existing uh, substrate out there where we've got good oyster colonization, looking at 
oyster density and size frequency distribution. Uh, as Josh mentioned, we uh, had a number, have had and continue to have uh, a number of stakeholder engagements um, where we're, we're meeting with people and uh, getting their feedback. Uh, and then there's a lot of other considerations that run and feed into the design. Uh, there are lots of seagrass beds in the area and we don't want to have any negative impact to those. So we're working around those. Um, you know, we want to know what the wave climate is because um, the western end of our project is uh, much more protected by the barrier islands than the eastern end of our project. Uh, the bathymetry is different across the project. It's uh, steeper and deeper over on the east end than, than, on, than it is on the west end. And there's a, you know, all these different uh, considerations, regulatory stakeholder. There's the infrastructure. And uh, I'll touch on that. I'm going to move along a little bit here. So uh, back to the infrastructure, there's are these uh, a number of drainage outfalls. Uh, some of them are large box culverts like this one that goes under the road. Some of them are, are round pipes that are much smaller. And there's a couple of things I want to point out. Uh, these are a significant focal point for erosion. And I think that's for several reasons. One is it's indented into the shoreline. Two is it's a vertical slope. Um, compared to the the areas where there's not a an outfall, and um, and there's a pretty good number of oysters and, and happy oysters at the mouth of these. Uh, we also found it really interesting when you look at the aerials. These this is post Michael uh, post Hurricane Michael aerials. You can see these little black segments of pavement are areas that got washed out and had to be repaved on an emergency basis after the storm. And most of those washout areas appear to be uh, co-located with these drainage outfalls. And so uh, we're we're kind of zoning in, zooming in on those um, and and using those to. Uh, help direct uh, some of our design. Uh, we want to make sure that we that we address all of those where we can. Uh, and I, I just want to point out too that um, those outfalls uh, can have a pretty significant uh, benefit to our project in that they are bringing nutrients, they're bringing fresh water, and they're bringing fine suspended particles uh, into the bay, which the oysters and the marsh uh, will like hopefully not too much in the way of sedimentation that would bury the reefs, but that the uh, the marsh could capture those suspended sediments. All right, so here's a snapshot of an aerial of our project area. This is pretty representative of what you see out there. There's uh, you see the dark areas out in the water are submerged seagrass beds, primarily Halidule, uh, Ridei, which is shell grass, um, although there are some other species as well. Uh, and then there's the intertidal zone, which is mostly unvegetated, got a um, riprap along much of the area. And so we're, we're looking at those areas and it's a very gentle sloping shoreline. You can go out some places um, 100 or 200 meters and it's only waist deep. Um, or maybe not 200 meters, 200 meters probably neck deep. But still, it's 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 very shallow, um, and so we're using the elevations and the uh, presence of the seagrass beds to drive our design in terms of where the footprint of the reefs can go, where the footprint of the marshes can go. Uh, we've got areas where we're calling these offshore reefs, where it's not right adjacent to a marsh, uh, and areas where we have marsh along the shoreline. We want to make sure it's protected with something. If if there's no offshore reef protecting it, uh, then we are uh, planning to put a a strip along the edge of the marsh, uh, often referred to as a sill. Uh, those will have breaks in them every 75 feet or less uh, to allow any marine organisms to to uh, escape if they get trapped. Uh, the plants that we intend to use are primarily going to be Spartina alperniflora, 
although other species will be used to add diversity. Uh, and similar to this, finding that sweet spot in terms of the elevation uh, for the oysters, we're also looking at, okay, well, where are uh, the Spartina alternaflora plants doing, um, and where are they growing in the area? So we're using that as a reference data to help drive our design. Here's some examples of the sills. Uh, of course, they provide some protection and also provide habitat around the marsh. Some of the materials that we're considering uh, are uh, the typical rocks or recycled concrete that are broken down and processed with rebar removed and everything. So they're essentially the, the look and, and act like rocks. Uh, there's different oyster catcher materials uh, and other types of materials that are similar to that that other folks have developed. Um, there's also reef balls uh, and uh, these concrete, um, they're basically like cinder blocks uh, that are designed to lock together. Those are called oyster castles. And there's a whole bunch of other uh, products like these. So these, these give you an idea of the types of materials we're looking for. Basically what we're looking for is something that doesn't include plastic because we don't wanna uh, have something out there that's gonna eventually break down and, and be a marine debris issue or, or uh, add to microplastics problem. Uh, and I see I'm probably about out of time. So let me uh, think that's the last slide. So uh, our next steps, we're just gonna keep gathering uh, some more field data that's going to help inform our design. Uh, we should be uh, finished with our designs this spring. And we, uh, this, this symposium is perfect for helping us to collaborate with other researchers. Um, and then we're going to be looking to coordinate with different suppliers and contractors who will help with uh, building the project. So uh, there is a Facebook page for the project or, uh, you know, Please let us know any feedback you have. You can send information to livingshore at arpc.org, or you can uh, call Josh or myself anytime. Uh, and we would love to go out and uh, have a site visit with, with anybody at uh, just about any time. And I think that is it. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, yeah, we're a little bit over on time um, and there are some questions. And um, what I'm gonna ask is uh, that we transfer those questions over to the Padlet. Uh, or if you want to um, email either of the guys directly, uh, I just gave you the, the, the website is, is right there. Sorry, I've got too many boxes open on my screen, but um, we're gonna move on to the next presentation. And uh, thank you both very much. Um, we're gonna move to another uh, critical uh, shoreline in, in Franklin County out to Little St. George Island. Uh, up next, we have Dr. Michael Sterick and his graduate student, Kelsey Schwinn. And they are gonna give you an overview of their UAS SFM surveying of hurricane impacts to Little St. George Island. So Mike and Kelsey, if you guys want to pop on up, we'll let you take it away. Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me? I can hear you, Mike, and I can see Kelsey. Yeah, I'm on a MacBook, so I had issues with this um, during the testing, and it doesn't like GoToMeeting for some reason. So unfortunately, my webcam is not working. So I'll just go on. Um, let me see. Can we transition the slides? There we go. Okay. So yeah. So I'm Mike Sterick with uh, the Conrad Blucher Institute for Surveying and Science in Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. And so we're going to present a little bit of our work on use of unmanned aircraft system surveying on Little St. George Island, and specifically look at uh, Hurricane Michael impacts out there. And just want to acknowledge my co-author, Kelsey Swin. She'll be presenting midway through, a uh, grad student in Coastal Marine System Science, a uh, PhD student at Texas A&M Corpus Christi, and then also Megan Lamb with the Florida DEP and the ANR. She's been a huge help in getting us out there and allowing us to go have a great time surveying out at the NUR. So in terms of UAS for coastal monitoring or coastal surveying, um, 
and we're really talking about small us and so for the faa that's less than 55 pounds including payload our payload here is just rgb camera um, we're talking a few a few pounds of, of payload so so very small uas relatively speaking um, some of the advantages in terms of aerial mapping would be you know access to harder reach environments um, I will say it's lower cost mapping at local scales, not extending across, you know, entire shorelines of the state of Florida, but at local scales can be very cost effective. We get hyperspatial resolution imagery. So, you know, mil, you know centimeter resolution down to millimeter if you, if you wanted it. Uh, quick analyses, detailed spatial assessments. Uh, one of the big advantages, I think, is the flexibility. We can target kind of specific weather conditions and the temporal repeatability. And then really what we do is we use it for photogrammetry and to reconstruct the uh, the terrain in three dimensions um, and derive basically a point cloud similar to LIDAR, uh, but just using the cameras. Some of the limitations uh, include things such as flight time endurance are still challenges with, the, with, these, with this technology, um, especially in high winds. Again, hard to map large geographic areas, uh, weather, can be an issue uh, with these platforms and really wind is the number one issue I would say depending on your platform and then um, you know regulations are still a challenging aspect. So what we use it for really is what we call structure for motion photogrammetry so as we fly these these drones or UAS we're acquiring overlapping imagery and very high overlap compared to traditional photogrammetry so 80 percent side lap in lap um, and we take that data and then we use software to process it. And really what these software do is they're just kind of automating features that they find between overlapping images or they're called key points. And if we can basically correspond those features or key points in the software through these overlapping images, then the physics say light rays must intersect. And basically what it does is it can uh, solve for where the camera position and orientation is of each photo at the time they were acquired. And then provided if we have GPS on board, that information is georeferenced, and in the process, we can reconstruct three-dimensional coordinates on the ground. And then what the software will do is you get this kind of sparse point cloud. Um, it tries to go through where it couldn't match features in the imagery, other locations of pixels, and it tries to densify and find 3D coordinates, and eventually get what's called a dense 3D point cloud. So that's really our survey product. And then we'll take that 3D point cloud and create GIS survey products. And the biggest one would be digital elevation models, so we'll tie that to a vertical datum like NABD88, we can do source some orthomosaics and other items like that. So our surveys at, at Little St. George Island, we've been coming out to the ANR since 2016. And really, we started doing a lot of terrestrial LIDAR work at beach profile sites, SCT wetland sites. And we were flying the U.S. mainly for imagery. But in 2017, we started really focusing on mapping uh, the entire beach of Little St. George Island. It's about nine miles of linear beach. Um, we mapped about half the island in 2017, and we had issues with wind. 2018, we were able to map the entire beach in four days. Um, 2019, two days. And then 2020, we were able to actually get approval to go out back in September, and we mapped in one day. So we really improved in our abilities. And I'll just mention that in 2018, when we went out there in July, we, we collected data about two months before the Hurricane Michael. So Kelsey will be using that data and the 2019 data to analyze some of the changes out there. So in terms of our advancements in U.S. survey, because we were able you know, to go from four day, five day surveys now down to a day for that stretch of beach, uh, the biggest advancement was really in the GPS technology. So originally we were out there with Phantom 4 Pro DJIs and this fixed wing platform, um, 20 megapixel cameras, and they have what's called autonomous GPS. They're not very accurate GPS. Uh, then we progressed to these platforms that have what we call real-time kinematic or post-process kinematic GPS, which just means they're more accurate. We can correct the image geolocations to improve our georeferencing. And then now our real workhorse is this platform called the Wingtr One here on the right, which is kind of a neat platform where it takes off vertically and then transitions to fixed wing. It's got a very good 42 megapixel RGB camera, but it has a very good post-process kinematic GPS on board. And why that's useful is in the uh, in 2016-17, we used to run long aerial control networks along the beach, and that took most of our time to do the surveys. We'd spend all day just laying out targets, surveying them in, very tedious. Now what we can do is just put a few out there to just check our accuracies, and we set up a GPS base station. We let that run while we're flying, and then after we're done surveying, we can go back and post-process the GPS locations of the image coordinates from the drone, and we can go from several meters of error down to really less than 10 centimeter vertical error. So that's been a big progression. 
Um, quickly, I'll mention that we were also flying U.S. LiDAR. So in 2019, we did some work off island um, at a wetland site in the Anner. Uh, the real advantage with LiDAR in, uh, is really for vegetation. Um, you get a bit better penetration through gaps in vegetation compared to the photogrammetry. But overexposed beaches um, and shoreline structure for motion can work really, really well and, and a bit easier of a process. Uh, I'll mention what we, we also built a site called golf3d.org. That's a work in progress. It run, runs off Amazon, but it we're providing this data that we've been collecting out there for the past basically five years. It's coming up and being provided. Uh, University of Florida is also sharing some of their data, collecting at other sites and a partner on it. Um, you can download point clouds, visualize them. Uh, the imagery, again, it's a work in progress, but some of the inner data is up there. And quickly, just a few examples. This is our Wingtra platform. I'll move fast through this. Um, here's some survey uh, photos just from years past. On the bottom here is 2019, pre-COVID. We're all loaded up on the boat. Here's Megan Lamb. Um, there's an Eastern Diamondback that we ran into doing a terrestrial ladder survey this past uh, September. And there was a lot of rainfall. There was an alligator in a ponding area right off the beach. So that's some of the beautiful things you run into at Little St. George. And this is just an example of a 3D fly through of a point cloud from our 2018 survey. And I'll just play it very quickly, a snippet, and see if it plays. And then um, I'll turn it over to Kelsey. And again, this is just created from a 2018 uh, from the imagery, a dense 3D point cloud. And we're getting roughly about 1,000 points per square meter. So very, very dense. OK, so I will move forward and turn it over to Kelsey. OK. Great. Well, I'm excited to be here today um, and then also discuss how we're actually using some of these surveys. And uh, one of the objectives that we've been working on is actually using the UAS surveys to quantify how Hurricane Michael impacted Little St. George Island. And Hurricane Michael made landfall on October 9th, 2018. So just a couple months again after that 2018 survey um, that our lab conducted in July with the UAS platform. So this is the data that was used specifically for this project. And in order to represent the pre-storm conditions of Little St. George Island, we used the July 2018 imagery that was collected with the UAS to generate an elevation model. And then we had the May 2019 survey with the UAS that was again generated used to generate an elevation model, and then those could be directly compared. Um, so you can see there on the top, we have just a quick example image of the point cloud that was derived from the 2018 pre-storm conditions versus the post conditions. Um, and that's the point cloud that was then used to generate an elevation model as seen there on the bottom. Okay, and then uh, one of the objectives here is to determine the volumetric changes that were caused from the impact of Hurricane Michael. So again, using just those two elevation models with a GIS software called Global Mapper, there's a tool that you can run and it will output statistics such as total volumetric changes, um, erosion, accretion, as well as the net volumetric change for different transects. So we did this for um, 10 meter transects, Alongshore transects as well as 100 meter bins, as you can see there in the image, for the entirety of the island, including the exposed or the at least the exposed beach and four dunes for the island. So you can see in the map there, it's showing you the volumetric changes. Um, what we found is that the western segment, far western segment of the island, where you can see negative values, there were he um, heavy amounts of erosion. So negative is representing erosion there, and then positive values represent accretion. And then I have these volumetric statistics here for the entirety of the island. And we determined that utilizing that workflow, uh, there was a total volumetric change of 554,000 cubic meters of sediment that was redistributed. And then it also, again, breaks that up into erosion, which was approximately 384,000 cubic meters and accretion as well, which is approximately 170,000 cubic meters. Um, so ultimately, the net volumetric change for the island was approximately 214,000 cubic meters, a loss 
of 214,000 cubic meters. And you can also see uh, we can populate the statistics for both the western and eastern segments of the island. And you'll notice there that the western segment of the island, um, even though it's actually less area, accounted for um, a higher volumetric change in the eastern segment. Okay. The next slide. Think. Oh, thank you. And then this is also another way to just depict that data. This is the average change in elevation along the baseline. The baseline beginning at zero is the western segment, and then it moves along to the far eastern segment of the island. And again, you'll see here that the average elevation change, there's a greater um, amount of erosion toward the western segment of the island, as well as the far eastern segments. But this allows you to just see um, specifically along the uh, portion of the island what it's looking like. So we actually did see an average increase even along a portion of the eastern segment there as well. And then also something that's really valuable is what we call this DEM of difference. That's just showing you the elevation changes between those two models. And this allows you to really get a better idea, visualizing at least, where we're seeing the elevation changes. And negative values, again, represent erosion and positive represent accretion. And you'll notice here um, the four dunes were substantially impacted. And this is the trend for most of the island. So again, you'll notice that up to negative four loss of elevation along those four dunes is very prevalent again throughout the island and that's where the majority of erosion occurred. Also something we've done is look at shoreline movement. So we used a lot, utilized a one meter shoreline contour and using um, what's called the digital shoreline analysis system, which is a GIS extension software for ARC GIS. It allows you to populate statistics looking at how that contour or shoreline elevation has changed between the two models. So we see here um, that negative values represent erosion or inland migration of the shoreline, and then positive values would represent um, accretion or seaward migration of the shoreline. And again, we go back to noticing that the western segment has very uh, severe erosion or inland migration of that shoreline contour. And then actually for the eastern segment of the island, we see positive rates there. And that might have a lot to do with um, seeing from the elevation model or the difference elevation model we looked at previously that there does seem to be a trend of accretion on the beach and erosion on the four dunes. So that accretion on the beach might have influenced this as well. And again, we can look at this on the eastern and western segments. And you'll notice that the western segment of the island experienced negative six meters or inland migration of that shoreline, whereas the eastern segment experienced positive movement, um, accretion or seaward migration of that shoreline. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay, next one, please. And then here we have also we looked at the dune crest elevation or changes induced from Hurricane Michael. Um, so you'll notice here looking at that graph that there's just a general reduction of the dune crest elevations following the impact. So we have black is representing the pre-storm 2018 elevation model uh, crest and then the post-storm is the gray there and you'll notice that for the most part Again, as mentioned earlier, along the islands that we do see a reduction in dune crest. And I do want to point out on the bottom, we have two images. That's the same segment of the island. And you'll notice that on the left, that's the pre-storm elevation model. And you can see that four dune line. And then the right shows the same segment following the hurricane. And it allows you to really see just how much damage um, or devastation those dunes experienced. So they're really just on the right hand side in the post-storm DEM, hardly present anymore at all. And we do need to be careful um, in terms of potential vegetation bias. So I'm going through and double checking these as well, just to ensure that uh, these dune crest elevations aren't being influenced by vegetation. 
or making it look like there was more severe erosion than there actually was. But that's what we're seeing again. So the general trend is definitely a loss or erosion of the dunes along the island. And this allows us to see that again, so distance long baseline for the entirety of the island. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Kelsey and Mike. All Josh, right. do we have yeah. um, the opportunity? I know we're low on time. Um, we just have uh, Scott Hausman had a comment um, that landfall was October 10th and not the 9th. So there's another <laughs> a wrestling match that needs to happen. I am seeing, Thank I you. would love to see your source for that. I'm seeing contradictory things. So I've actually put in a lot of time trying to find out whether it's the 9th or 10th. And I've seen papers that say both days. So I would love to yeah. actually have the Yeah, article. please get in touch with uh, Scott Hausman. Uh, we've posted that. Okay, Thanks, thank Scott. you. I've blocked it out. I just, uh, <laughs> it was like a whole week of wholeness. Yeah. Like Harvey um, for us. <laughs> yes, yes, and um, and also recognizing you guys calling in from Texas. So appreciate you guys joining us today, despite everything that that you all have been dealing with. Um, thank you. No, thank you for having us. We really appreciate it. And um, I was going to say too. I hope that you guys can join the the climate change and sea level rise mm -hmm. session later this afternoon. Um, we're going to be highlighting the ecological effects of sea level rise project, and we did pick and choose a few small components of that work, but there there were also components that uh, looked at the barrier island system and and um, and how that's changing and and how um, you know our our shorelines in in the county will will change dramatically into the future. So uh, might be neat to have your perspective um, for those those presentations as well excellent Great. thank you okay. and uh just uh check your inbox i have a question here that we didn't get to get to um and then i can post it publicly all right thanks josh we'll uh transition now to uh we have a handful of presentations on hydrology within the river the floodplain and and then the bay and uh the first presentation we'll have is from dr steve lightman and uh, he is uh, affiliated with FSU and is working on a contract uh, through U.S. Fish and Wildlife, or a contract for Fish, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, Steve will be highlighting variability in stream flow in the ACF basin. So, Steve, I can see your box, but we can't see you. Yeah, I can see my box and I can't see me either. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's dark in here. In the uh, webcam tab of GoToWebinar, check to uh, click on the drop down menu for the webcams. And under preferences, you might be able to select a different webcam and make sure um, the right one is selected for you. All right, take okay, it away. So, so, what I'm going to talk today about is how climate variability will affect flow and reservoir elevations in the uh, ACF watershed and water, and this is a presentation I worked on with myself, with Dr. Ibrahim Amadi Sharaf and Dr. Manuela Brunner at uh, the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado. And uh, water is kind of a funny issue in the ACF, freshwater inflow. It's what's prompted the lawsuit. And one of the things we happen to be coincide with when the oysters had problems was also during a drought, but uh, correlation does not necessarily imply causation. And as some of our talks have shown us, it's a lot more complicated than just freshwater inflow. So one of the important con considerations in anticipating future changes is an expectation of variability, such that there'll be a lot more extreme droughts and flood events are expected to be happening in the future so that uh, there are many possible realizations of the historic climate and the one we experience is the historic record is only one of many possible realizations. Now where this becomes a problem is that when they designed the water control manual for the ACF storage reservoirs, 
It was based on an unimpaired flow set, which was derived from the historic climate. And so the question we're asking here is how well will the rules which were developed under historic climate function in alternate realizations of the historic climate? So to address this issue, we worked up 100 plausible flow scenarios which differed in consideration of extremes from of uh, both multi-year drought and large floods were included. The volume of water delivered on an annual basis was roughly preserved. And uh, all of these scenarios were then fed into a uh, water management model of the basin. And then what I'm gonna do is summarize some of the output that we get from this. And, uh, oh, this isn't showing the whole slide, but, oh, there it is, okay. So up on top is the uh, historic, uh, what actually happened then. So what we did is, is we did a hundred variations where within the years we preserved the volume of water, but we changed the distribution of the water so that there'd be more droughts and more floods. And this was done on a reach by reach basis. So this wasn't done just for the whole basin, but it was done for each of the reaches. And this is how the models were developed, where you have a reach up here in the Chattahoochee to Buford Dam, another one down to here, and so on, the Flint and the Apalachicola. So in looking at what we came up with, an important consideration in analyzing flow in the basin is the frequency of low flow events. That's what's caused a lot of problems with the oysters and prolonged low flow events were associated with the collapse of the oyster industry. And they also result in a drying out of the river floodplain. And so by low flow, I'm looking at frequencies of flow below 6,000 CFS, and below 5,000 CFS. And uh, 6,000 CFS is a little below roughly a flow that's exceeded 10% of the time. And uh, under the current management rules, flows do not go below 5,000 CFS unless emergency drought provisions are in place. And the way emergency drought provisions are done under the water control manual is, is that in this dotted line, they do composite storage, which is the volume of storage, which is in West Point, uh, George and Lake Lanier. And when the volume of storage on a day of the year falls below this dotted line here, then the release that they shoot for is 4,500. If not, the release will be 5,000. But often when we're in drought or emergency drought, the flow in the Apalachicola River will be greater than either of those numbers. And that's because the Flint is essentially unregulated and Jim Woodruff during extreme droughts has virtually no storage. So if you have a high flow in the Flint, you're gonna go above the minimum. So it's not only how often that we're in these droughts that happen, but how often does it actually occur? So in the following slide, we're gonna look at the average days per month for which flows were less than 6,000 and 5,000. And when you look at this, this is with the unimpaired flows as the input to the model. And this is with the modified, and then this is the average over all of them the uh, 100 simulations that we did. And then what you can see is, is that if you have a greater frequency of droughts imposed into the unimpaired flow set relative to what occurred historically, which is expected under climate change, that we're gonna see both more occurrences of being in the emergency drought and a lot more occurrences of having flows below 6,000. And considering the problems that we've had with low flows, that does not speak well for what's coming. So what I'm going to be doing is, is that we have looked 
for each day of the year. And I'm going to show you on a four month cycle, both January 1st, April 1st, and September 1st, what happens at Jim Woodruff Outflow and then at Lake Lanier, West Point Lake, and George to show you what's happening with storage. So here we're looking at Jim Woodruff Outflow. And I put in two charts here because as you can see on the y-axis, the range is at 20,000 CFS for that small area that you really can't see differences. That's a lot of water. At high flow, it shows up. At low, it doesn't. And that's because we have such a variability in flow in the ACF basin. And coming across, the black line is the observed. And this is for January 1st only. The orange line is that for an extreme low, 25% is a moderate low, 50% is about the median. That's the uh, sort of medium high, and that's sort of a high flow. And that what you can see is, is that the flow definitely drops and gets a lot lower, and you're having more occasions of the flow being, and this is in January, which is generally a higher flow month. Now, the interesting one is, is in looking at Lanier. What you're seeing happening at Lanier is, is that under the unimpaired flows, the lowest elevation seen at Lanier is 1048. Under the revised scenarios that we did, you were seeing Lanier drop down to the bottom of the reservoir and they run out of water 10% of the time. And in the 100 simulations, the elevation went below 1035 in 14 years. And so consequently, uh, this alone suggests that the water control manual, which was tuned to the historic climate, doesn't work under an altered climate. Now, when we look at West Point, the bottom of West Point pool is 620. And what you're seeing here is, is that it approaches it, but doesn't quite reach it. And then at Walter F. George, the bottom is 184. And again, it approaches it, but it doesn't reach it. So in summary, Woodruff drops to the minimum release under the water control manual under the revised, and it's something that does not happen with the historically in January 1st. Lanier was impacted more by the increased droughts in the revised data set, and uh, the more extreme floods led to increases in Woodruff outflow and higher elevations only at George. So now we're going to jump to a more of a spring-type situation in April. And then what you can see in April, oops, I think I, looking at Woodruff, again, we drop down to in April having an emergency drought situation. And you can see uh, that in a number of the years, even in the median, that we observed that the low flows fall below what was seen historically. Again, you're seeing it linear a drop, but it doesn't run out of water in the spring. At uh, West Point, you're seeing a fairly high elevation, 620 is the bottom at West Point. So you're not seeing West Point drop that severely. And at George, the bottom is 184 and you're not seeing a drop that's that severe. So our observations from April is, is that in the extreme ranges, Woodruff outflow drops to the minimum release under the water control manual and something that does not happen in the floor unimpaired flow set. Lanier was impacted by the increased droughts, but did not approach the bottom as it did in earlier months of the year. year. And West Point and George do not even come close to their bottom, really. 
And so the more extreme fronts led to increases in woodruff outflow at higher elevations only at George. So the final one I'm gonna look at is in fall. So what we're seeing in fall then is, is again, you'll notice that first of all, flows are a lot lower in the fall in the ACF than in earlier in the year. And what you're seeing is again, that the flow drops down to the 4,500 number. And you're seeing Lanier again in the fall dropping to the bottom of its pool at the 10% increase. You're seeing uh, at West Point, it drops down, but it doesn't go anywhere near the 620, which is the bottom of West Point. And at George, with the bottom being at 180, it doesn't come close to it. So, in the extreme ranges, Woodruff drops to the minimum release under the water control manual over 10% of the time. Lanier was impacted by the droughts and uh, more extreme led to it. So the question is, what is happening? Why, what's going on? And in looking at this, and this, we're sort of in the preliminary stretches of this work, but what it seems to me is, is that the Corps of Engineers tuned the water control manual to the historic climate. But I don't think too many people are expecting historic climate to continue into the future, which says to me that we need to be looking at maybe how to tune it to what's coming instead of what happened. And uh, some of the conclusions that I see happening is, is that extreme low flows, flows less than 6,000 CFS could occur much more often and much more frequently in the future, that the three principal storage reservoirs are out of balance when you alter the climate. And so what you see happening is, is Lanier taking a bigger hit than West Point and George. And part of the question is, why does Lanier take a bigger hit than the other two? And part of it could be is the way that the rule curves are set up where they have the winter drawdowns of West Point and George Pool, but not at Lanier. So where are we going with this research then? Is, is that uh, the next steps we're going to be taking is, is first, uh, we need to be defining performance metrics. We need to really decide with regard to inflow into Apalachicola River and Apalachicola Estuary is what type of flows do we need and how does this relate to the sustainment of the ecosystem? And uh, this is something that under ABSI that we're going to be working toward. And the second part is, is that uh, we need to be looking at is, is, is it possible to manage the reservoirs in a way to better balance the reservoirs and to reduce some of this impact with the low flows that we were seeing with regard to that. And uh, one of the things before I go into just asking for questions is, is that we need to realize this is that in the Apalachicola watershed, we have a situation where we have a fairly large river and we have very limited storage capacity in the storage reservoirs. And for example, if you compare the ACF to the Colorado, the average flow in the ACF is greater when you get down to the mouth than the Colorado, but the Colorado Basin has over 40 times the storage capacity. So that means that things that they can do in the Colorado with regard to storage capacity, we can't do in the Apalachicola because we just don't have it. And so with that, I would just open up to questions. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have one that popped up from Ken Jones. Uh, it says, your model points are very interesting. Isn't the story even worse with regards to flow? My expectation would be that the core would never let uh, the level of linear get that low, therefore holding back water resulting in, therefore holding back water resulting in even less flow at the Woodruff. 
I would say that the fact that Lanier gets drawn down perhaps suggests an opportunity that the Corps would be willing to revise the water control manual because I agree they would never let Lanier run out of water and let Atlanta run out of water. So perhaps they would be open to revising the water control manual when they realize that if you alternate what's happening with the climate, that it would cause problems. Great, thank you so much. Um, that was the only question that we had in the box. I don't see anything on the Padlet, so take it away, Jenna. I had a quick question, Steve, and along those same lines, um, this is very interesting looking ahead how amenable do you think the core is in making revisions to the water control manual? After and I, I talk to them, theory, I have like no theoretical. idea. Jenna, I have absolutely no idea, but I would think that I am going to be talking with them. And one of the things, I've also been working with the Fish and Wildlife Service over the last couple of years. And one of the things that I've done is, is that we worked on aligning the CORE's REST SIM model with the STELLA model that I use so that they're compatible. And the CORE has approved and says the STELLA model and the REST SIM come out with very similar results. And so I would think that a payback that we can get for that work is, is that the CORE is gonna believe what I'm saying more and they might be amenable, I don't know. We're gonna be talking to them and I'm gonna approach them with what I've found for this and just we'll see where it goes. Awesome. I see a couple more questions have popped up. Uh, Georgia Ackerman had a question. What's the best way to keep abreast of this research? Uh, APSI, the APSI meetings. I will be doing presentations with the, I work with APSI. I'm doing the freshwater inflow for Steve Morey's modeling for the Apalachicola estuary. So staying in touch with APSI will keep you abreast of what's going on with that. And Chad Taylor also has a question, which I think is a little bit loaded and probably a similar answer. Uh, but he asks, can the bay be managed successfully under those magnitude of changes? Uh, I am going to be, now remember we have small reservoirs and a big river. And so that one of the problems we run into in the ACF is the capacity to be able to actually deal with some of these issues and so that's something that we're going to be investigating and then inve looking at ways of possibly doing this and so it's too early to really say yes no or maybe very good but, thank you so we much are looking at it. okay excellent thank you all right we're gonna shift into a break and we're gonna aim to start up again at 10:50. If everyone can stretch your legs and uh, and uh, we'll see you back very shortly. Thank you so much, everybody. All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started with our next session. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, I'm Kim Wren. I'm the assistant manager here at the reserve, and I will be hosting the next session of the symposium. So uh, this session is going to take us into lunch. We have four presentations lined up and we'll go ahead and get started and jump back in. I'd like to welcome and introduce Ken Jones. He's the project manager for Apalachicola Bay and Riverkeeper and the Apalachicola River Slough Restoration. And he will be giving a presentation on estimating flows through East River and the impact on East Bay. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Ken, if you're ready. I am ready. Do you hear me? We can hear you. And you see, oh, I'm showing up. Okay. And right, thank you. I need to get on to my presentation. I still have the break slide on oh, my screen. One, one second, Ken. We'll get your right set up in just a moment. While he's doing that, I'll just, I just want to, yeah give a shout out to Steve Lightman and the work he's doing while we're looking so closely into Apalachicola Bay and rightly so. Um, there's a lot of larger basin wide issues that are still out there even with the uh, with the litigation and his models and work 
put Florida, give Florida a staining that's very uh, comparable to the core, and it, it will force the core to actually listen to things that, that people are saying about baseline management. So uh, it's great to see the work, and it was very interesting. So to get started, um, our project funded by the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation is the Apalachicola Slough Restoration Project. Um, I'm gonna be talking uh, today just about the East River and what we're doing there. This is a shot by a, uh, from a drone flown by Scott Walls, part of our team uh, of the headwaters of East River. And you can see it meandering back through uh, the, uh, the marsh itself. Let's see, trying to advance. I'm not seeing it advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, our project is sponsored by the Apalachicola River Keeper. Georgia Ackerman is the River Keeper and Executive Director, and uh, they have done a, a great job of helping us uh, get this grant uh, through the process and moving. Our project team uh, includes Matt Condoff and Matt Deach, uh, Scott Walls, uh, who were all part of some uh, original uh, studies and basically led, uh, developed the groundwork for the slough restoration projects. There are, ge there are geomorphologists and, and land surveyors. We also have AJ Sharma and John Tracy who are doing uh, swamp forestry work. Um, they'll be reproducing some of the work by Light and Darcy and looking at uh, improvements to uh, the swamps uh, due to the, uh, the excavation of sediments out in the slough restoration projects. And the engineering team, including uh, Jawa Zhu, who's helping with uh, some of the modeling for the East River, and uh, Dan Tonsmeyer, who is uh, will be working as our construction manager and is the uh, ex river keeper. And Michael Gangloff uh, is an, a muscle expert in the freshwater system. And you heard from Andy Gannon already about blue crabs in East Bay. So it is slow. And if you want to say next when it's uh... Yeah, move to the next slide. That'd be great. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, a lot of thanks to the Water Management District and the Fish and Wildlife. Uh, these projects are on their uh, riparian properties. Uh, and so we would not be able to do these without uh, their support. Uh, these slough restoration projects are part of the larger swim basin wide management plan of the Water Management District. So, um, like I said, we'll be doing Douglas Slough Spider Cut. Ian is part of our project and I'll be talking about East East River today. Next. So there's two pieces of the puzzle for us. One is um, kind of the thesis statement is that uh, sediments from dredging of the Apalachicola River have basically clogged the uh, clog East River and has, have reduced flows into East River and ultimately into East Bay. Um, so the two questions are, is that true, which we, we will have to be able to demonstrate um, to be able to even to get a permit to do this work. And uh, if we do do the excavation uh, in each river, will it uh, significantly change the flow patterns and increase freshwater into, into East Bay, which everybody says is an important aspect. Part of that is uh, doing the calculations to, to look at what the impacts of a uh, East River are, uh, excavating the area of East River and how they would impact the East Bay uh, area. So this is the DEM that uh, Steve Morey and the ABSI folks are using as, as their base map for elevations uh, in their big model. And what we did was we talked to uh, Dr. Morey and his team, and because of the level of modeling they're doing and, and, and the uh, advanced nature of that modeling, um, we chose to collaborate with his group and allow him to do the modeling. And we did a lot of the work to ground truth the, uh, the whole distributary system 
and help improve uh, the data set that he's going to be using for the modeling itself. So the East River uh, is this piece right up through here. And you can see on the on the NOAA's DEM, it basically disappears. It doesn't exist. And here's the headwaters that you saw that picture from. Um, all of this dis distributed, area, uh, distributed area is important because it siphons off quite a bit of water uh, from the main stem of the Apalachicola into the East Bay area. And no one has really uh, done a lot of work to estimate really how much of that water does go to East Bay and, um, and what that effect would be on East Bay if we do, if we model it correctly. And Steve's program will be one of the first ones to really take a significant look at that. The fact is, is so much water comes down the Apalachicola River and through the main stem, uh, and it just shoots out into the main body of, of uh, Apalachicola Bay, and it acts almost like a fire hose. And depending on wind direction, it either flows east or west uh, and bypasses um, the East Bay area. And if you don't model this area correctly, you lose the dynamics of the freshwater inflow into the system. Next. Uh, so here's the original uh, model um, grid that they generated from the DEM itself. And you can see that um, it really does not include the East River uh, hardly at all. Um, and we're working with his team to ground truth the DEM to improve the resolution of the bathymetry through that area so that we can get uh, get an accurate description of the geometry of the of the streams themselves to the next slide so we've done a lot of runs up and down the distributary system uh, we've mapped all of these pieces of the distributaries uh, and have processed that data uh, for uh, for steve's group uh, and they're using that to improve that that those portions of the model next and some of the things we found, um, this is up in the upper portion of the East River and the blue line on that graph to your right is the, the NOAA DEM and the brown line are the cross sections that we've done. Here's a couple examples where the DEM basically doesn't even show that there's a river in there. And uh, so we're uh, able to provide a much better idea of the geometry uh, of this system. Next slide. And here again, this is a little further down in the system, uh, 26, you can see is way off, that's still in the East River. And as you get down further into the system, the, the NOAA DEM uh, gets progressively better, um, but uh, we're adding resolution throughout that, throughout the entire system. Next slide. Here's a great example of the way the system changes. This is where the Little St. Mark's splits off of the St. Mark's River. Um, the oxbow that was the St. Mark's, um, as it runs around the outside here, has now come back and has joined the little St. Mark's. And here's a picture of that hole. And you can see an example of the head changes, which drives the flow patterns um, just in this short amount of area. Uh, on an outgoing tide. So water is just shooting out of the Little St. Mark's back into the St. Mark's River itself. Next slide. So um, we went out and um, uh, DEP established uh, RTK survey uh, level um, sites for us and we surveyed the upper uh, 14,000 feet of uh, of the East River. Uh, we set water level and water quality stations. Uh, we use DEP to set the RTK station uh, because they're the ones that are uh, supporting all of the Anner's NOAA uh, stations uh, in the Bay. So we are tied into the same datum uh, that, that all the Anner data is being collected at. And these two stations combined with the Butcher's Pen Station 
uh, further down on East River, which Anner installed in support of this project and other data that they're collecting, um, are all tied on to the same data. And we can look at water levels and other uh, constituents uh, from the data we collected in the same context that all of the ANR data is, is taken from. And this is hugely important. So we took uh, over 14,000 shots in that, in that reach uh, to do a very uh, detailed uh, survey of the uh, bathymetry and topography of this zone. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So next slide. So we uh, have collected, we've been, uh, we started setting up data uh, and collecting data in October after Hurricane Sally. Um, so this is the first data that we've been able to uh, get from our data stations. Um, Steve's point about uh, water levels is incredibly important. Um, 15,000 CFS is kind of considered the elevation. Uh, if you're above 15, 16,000 CFS, the floodplains become flooded over their banks. Um, and uh, the swamps and, and such are, are, are hydrated pretty well in those periods. Uh, our study, uh, importantly, is below 15,000 CFS and looking at improving flow patterns, mostly in the 5,000 to 10,000 CFS. And as we talk about um, you know, what our future is, part of this program is looking at how we can best um, utilize fresh water in our system, uh, reproducing uh, uh, water through all the sloughs uh, into the swamps at, the, at those lowest flows to give the, the swamps in the bay the best chance for recovery and um, uh, future productivity. So the data that we've collected here, the blue line is, our, is the head of East River. The brown line is uh, 14,000 feet down, so three miles down. Uh, incredibly different water level records, uh, very, very tidally uh, influenced um, up to uh, our lower water station. And you can see the head differences even at low flows at the, at the median flows, 15,000 CFS you know, as much as three feet over uh, these, this two and a half miles, it's an order of magnitude greater uh, difference in head uh, from the headwaters of the East River two and a half miles down uh, than there is from in the main stem of the Apalachicola River uh, from Sumatra down to the bay. Next slide. Um, interestingly, and here again, we're only at 15,000 CFS, so it doesn't, you know, this isn't a, a complete picture, uh, but at 15,000 CFS, there's not a great amount of difference uh, in the conductivity measurements. So you're not seeing much salt in this part of the bay, at least at 15,000. Now, I'm sure this will change a little bit as we start collecting data at the lower flows. Next. So from that, uh, those RTK surveys, we uh, took a center line right down the middle of the East River, which is the blue line that you're seeing. And then we also uh, drew a line that connected the lowest portions of East River from the headwaters down uh, through the 13, 14,000 feet that we're looking at. And so you can see, um, on the yellow line, there's uh, a lot of deeper sections uh, along the river, but there's some interesting things uh, about this, this data. Here's a good example of, of this region right in here, where the deepest portion and the mid uh, center line of the river are basically uh, the same. These are this is a very shallow region dropping into a pool, another shallow region dropping into another pool. Um, up here is the water level as we collected um, on uh, the day we were out collecting this data, which is um, February 1st. This top line is is kind of the high water mark and the low lot, this lower line is kind of the lower uh, water level 
during the data set that we collected itself. So this white line is a relatively arbitrary line that I drew in there is kind of a what if uh, situation of, okay, what should we set the bottom of the East River to be? And we're, you know, this is just to begin to look at, you know, potential uh, dredge uh, excavation uh, amounts and what the impact would be. So, you know, this line is going to change as our studies continue. We've just now begun. So, uh, but I want to talk about this a little bit as we go forward. Next slide. So, um, here's our, over here on the left is, is the full survey, 14,000 feet. We cut out a little section just for discussion purposes uh, here, uh, just to talk a little bit about what the data looks like. But you can see, you know, the, this is the deeper portion of East River. Uh, you get into a little shallow bend, but it's following a, a kind of a typical, uh, what you'd expect in a meandering river system with the kind of flows that we're seeing through here, deeper water on the outside bends uh, coming through. And this is pretty, this is like uh, eight or 9,000 feet down into the system. Go ahead to the next slide. So from the bottom looking up, um, here's a set of cross sections every 100 feet over about seven or 800 feet. And this is showing a pretty typical, what you would expect to kind of see from a, a, a river. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't look very impaired. Uh, the white line at the bottom was my dash line uh, for my guess at what I would have thought that the river would want to be. Um, we're getting close to the end. I'm, <laughs> I see you pop up there. Um, the 15,000 foot line is at the full bank elevation, which is which is uh, about two, uh, like we talked about before. And anything above that, it, it's going to flow through the bay uh, over the the floodplain itself. So that's that's an interesting cross section. And we're looking at everything as the water drops below that level. The next slide. Uh, you can see as you go up the system, it's getting a little bit shallower. There's only one section that actually meets the, that elevation and it gets shallower and shallower. And the next section, next slide. And even in this section, now in this section, we're getting into an area where it, it feels like it's pretty well clogged up. Uh, the, the water level in through here, the depth uh, is uh, about minus two. So you've got about four feet of water through this section. And so this would be the area that we would consider doing some excavation. Next slide. Um, this is just a cross section, kind of a what if, but to kind of give you an idea. Uh, so this is one of those sections that we did. If, this, if you looked at it on a one-to-one -one scale, we had a basically a 15 foot bottom width and and this would be a typical excavation drawing we're probably increasing the cross section uh, about 15 to 20 percent we went to a 25 foot bottom we're increasing it uh, by 35 percent but we're also increasing it in the most important portions of the flow regime uh, so you know looking at uh, excavating this material out of here uh, does indicate that we'd have a pretty good chance of, of increasing the flow. We just don't know how much it is yet. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, here's a, this is a shot of the head of the East River. You can see uh, up in here where uh, the contours are, uh, show where dr dredge spoil has drifted down and almost clogged this portion of the, of, of the headwaters up. One of the main areas we think would be really important, next slide, is to go ahead and excavate that area and open that whole system out. And I think okay. I'm on my last slide. And that, right, yeah. our whole goal is to, to uh, add more fresh water into the East, East River system. Okay, That's great, it. thank you. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we won't have any time for questions, but uh, yeah, if uh, anybody wants to address things, please uh, go on our Padlet uh, or um, drop a question in the box and I will make sure it gets answered. Thanks. 
Great. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for joining Thanks. us this morning and for sharing that information. Uh, next, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Chris Anderson with Auburn University, who will be presenting on salinity and forested wetlands along the tidal gradient on the lower Apalachicola River system. So I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Um, well, thank you. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here. I really appreciate uh, being invited to the symposium. Uh, really have enjoyed the talks I've heard yesterday and uh, particularly appreciate the last couple I've had. Uh, both um, Steve and Ken's uh, work, really interesting stuff. And um, it's kind of uh, helpful for my talk. Uh, I'm, I've been looking, uh, I say, I, we've been looking at the uh, tidal freshwater forested wetlands of the lower Apalachicola River. So I want to um, uh, quickly acknowledge a couple of co authors on this work. Uh, Saval Chelik was a master's student. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to be presenting today was part of her master's thesis. Uh, Latif Kalin is a uh, another faculty member with me at Auburn, and um, Mehdi Rezianeide, <laughs> that's a tough last name. Anyways, uh, Mehdi did a lot of the modeling work that I'll talk about today. So yeah, I mentioned we've been doing work looking at tidal forested wetlands, and so uh, this is the, a map kind of similar to what Ken just showed, looking at the lower river reach. And so if you go up the Apalachicola River, or one of the distributary rivers, um, uh, the wetlands along the river reach there uh, start off as, as marshland, but quickly transition to uh, forested wetlands. And so the map on the right there is probably a, a good way to look at this. That orange to gray transition is, is the tree line or the, the, the reach where we get into forested wetlands. And so forested wetlands, uh, tidal wetlands, freshwater forested tidal wetlands are um, fairly common, particularly in large river systems uh, like the Apalachicola, where there's a tremendous amount of, of fresh water coming down related to the river, but the proximity to the bay uh, kind of creates this tidal condition. And so they stay primarily fresh water, uh, but they are uh, suspect to some uh, saltwater intrusion. These are historically, I would say, understudied type of wetlands, um, but more recently there's a lot of attention, uh, rightfully so, because of the, uh, the potential for change. And so with increased sea level rise, for instance, there's concern um, that we might see greater uh, saltwater intrusion up into these normally freshwater systems. Uh, so climate change uh, causing uh, sea level rise and also potentially maybe increased hurricane, tropical storm incidents can increase that saltwater intrusion. Uh, and then uh, this can also be sort of coupled with uh, changes related to river flow. So we've been talking about that this morning. Um, whether it's climate induced or human induced, if we have uh, reduced river flows, that again can kind of change the salinity regimes in this tidal freshwater reach and uh, potentially uh, impact um, these, uh, these fresh, normally freshwater wetland systems. So our study objectives were really twofold for this, this project. Uh, we wanted to look at um, what is the salinity regime for this, uh, for these, uh, particularly these lower um, distributary rivers, which make up a lot of the freshwater tidal reach of the Apalachicola. Um, so we wanted to uh, build a hindcast model looking at um, salinity regimes along this reach and then couple this with some forest data to look at um, how the, uh, the freshwater tidal forested wetlands along that, that river reach uh, change and potentially change in response to these long-term salinity uh, shifts that occur across this gradient. So this was our general approach. We basically set up a, sort of a tidal gradient study. Um, and, and just like Ken was talking about, we used the East River, which is uh, sort of designated ER on this map, um, and set up stations uh, roughly up to 12 uh, river kilometers up the, the East River, and uh, setting up nine stations equidistant along the river reach there. And um, we set up a similar setup for the uh, St. Mark's River, which is sort of more in the interior of the, of the distributary river reach here of the lower Apalachicola. And so a similar setup, same number of stations. Each station, uh, we did do a forest survey. Uh, we set up 500 meters squared uh, survey plots, uh, roughly about 60 meters from the river edge. 
um, these plots were in proximity to a tidal inlet. So um, water exchange between the river and the uh, and these tidal freshwater forested wetlands, at least the surface water exchange tends to occur in these sort of small inlets that, that, um, that basically uh, go up and down the, the river systems there. Um, so we collected data on all the canopy trees. These are trees greater than 2.5 centimeters in diameter. Uh, and um, based on uh, species, uh, we calculated um, a species importance value for all the canopy trees based on their relative uh, density and their relative dominance in terms of basal area. For the stations that are on the um, on the on the extreme ends, and then the one in the middle, so the dark stars on that map on the bottom left, we also installed um, uh, water monitoring stations. And so for the water monitoring stations, we we used the tidal inlet and we installed a pressure transducer and a connectivity um, probe to basically um, measure and log um, the uh, yeah the water level and the connectivity of the water uh, at one hour intervals. And uh, connectivity we later on um, uh, converted into salinity data. The, um, yeah, so those were measured, those were put out in uh, June 2014 and we kept them in there until February of 2016. So about a year and a half's worth of, of data there. And, um, and again, the idea here eventually was to use this data to potentially build a salinity model for these. So looking at the raw data we collected, I've, I've sort of picked an area where we got sort of continuous data for all six of our stations. Um, in this case, we're looking at on the left, East River, and then the graph on the right is the St. Mark's River. So ER1 is the, it was the uh, station closest to the bay and ER9, in this case would be the one furthest up the river. And, and those number sequences work for the St. Mark's too. And what you're seeing is the uh, is a time series of salinity in those stations for uh, February through December of 2015. And so it's um, the, the, the numbers or the, the results were in some ways were, were what we expected. We had um, the largest salinity range in our, our downriver sites, ER1 and SMR1. Um, again, because of their proximity to the bay, um, they had uh, the greatest sort of um, range of salinity. But there's a pattern here that um, relates to uh, river flow. So you can see early in the season, uh, salinities tend to stay um, fairly consistent with one another. But as we get later into the season, as we get into the, into the summer and, and the fall months, um, we start to see the salinity creep up. And um, it's interesting to compare a little bit between the rivers here too, that uh, the East River, for instance, the middle uh, station, ER5, tended to really kind of uh, measure kind of intermediate between the, the two, uh, the upriver and the downriver sites, ER1 and ER9. Uh, but on the St. Mark's, uh, the, e, the, the middle uh, station tended to, um, Track a little closer to the uh, to the upriver station, um, with the exception of a, of a few spates you can see later in the fall where uh, salinities did creep up there as well. So it was interesting to look at that. That was the raw data, uh, but we used this raw data to um, there uh, um, to develop a model so that we could potentially hindcast what the salinity was at these stations going back 30 years. And so here's where the value of, of all this um, you know, data that's being collected uh, comes in. So we were able to utilize you know, river flow data from the USGS, uh, bay tide levels from, from NOAA, and um, a whole series of data that, um, from, from Ainer and other sources that we could feed into an artificial neural network model. And so this, um, if you're not familiar with artificial neural network models, um, it's really a, a, a sort of intensive computational modeling where you have these input layers, the data sources I just talked about, um, and you sort of train the model to um, uh, consider these inputs and these and sort of these computational layers, these sort of hidden layers as it's indicated on here, 
to generate a desired output, in this case, mean daily salinity at each one of our six stations. Uh, so it's kind of a machine learning type of approach to, to modeling. And we're able to sort of identify the important input layers that, that sort of guide or, or, or generate um, uh, the output or the salinity in this case. So uh, the models actually function very well. Um, you're looking at sort of um, the uh, comparison of the um, observed data versus the model predicted data. And um, you know, based on an Akaki information criterion, not surprisingly, the Apalachicola River discharge and the tide level at uh, Apalachicola Bay were, were the two sort of consistent and most strongly, um, or most important, I should say, variables for predicting uh, bay or uh, station salinity. So essentially, like I said, we have six now separate models for each one of our, our monitoring stations. And we can, we're able to take that data now and um, use it, use this historical data to make some estimations of salinity regime at each one of these six stations. And so that's what I'm showing here, actually. This is a, um, these are box plots of um, uh, modeled and interpolated uh, mean daily salinity for the East River and the St. Mark's River. So the, the interpolation is for the stations that were in between our monitoring stations. We just used river distance as a, a way to interpolate the data. Um, and so you're seeing, yeah, 30 years of, of, um, of estimated, or estimated uh, mean daily salinity. And so interestingly, the East River, um, and this kind of relates to some of what Kim was talking about, um, it had a much, um, uh, a more, can, I'd say a more um, narrower uh, general range in salinity than we saw in the St. Mark's River. So these are stations down here. And so going left to right on these graphs, you're going from um, the bottom of the river to the, to the top of, at least in terms of our stations. Um, so salinity on the left is uh, in this part of the graph anyways, looking at just you know, everything between um, uh, one parts per thousand and less. Most of the measures again, sort of showing up in that, um, you know, in this case, 0.1 to 0.3 range, but you can see the St. Mark's on the lower river had a higher sort of um, uh, average and median range, um, but declined very rapidly as it got down into that sort of middle uh, range and then further in our upper rivers uh, sections there. Um, and so the, um, I should mention here that these averages, I think I have that, yep, are, um, yeah, the, the long-term average again for the lower river reach, this is close to that tree line, 0.3 for uh, East River and then 0.63 for the um, St. Mark's. These are kind of consistent with, um, uh, long-term salinity averages that have been reported for tidal freshwater forested wetlands. So um, that was, um, yeah, that's, that was sort of consistent with what we've seen. Um, if we sort of expand the graph, essentially, this is the same graph now, just capturing the entire range, we can also detect uh, the number of sort of high um, salinity events that occurred. And keep in mind, these are daily averages. So um, these would be expected to occur during some of those drought years and things like that. Um, five parts per thousand is sort of seen as a, as a critical threshold for um, a lot of uh, freshwater species in terms of um, uh, inducing a, a stress and things like that. So I mentioned that we, we wanted to compare this to some of the forest survey data that we collected. And you know, based on our data, we ended up using some uh, the results of a, another study that we did, uh, we actually uh, set out 37 plots in the lower Apalachicola River and developed sort of this, uh, this two-way cluster analysis that you're looking at on the screen. Don't worry about trying to get into the details here. The only point I want to make here is that um, when you transition from the non-tidal to these tidal swamps, um, there's some definite changes in forest community that happen. And we did indicator analyses, you know, to kind of a um, I, you know, to associate with these non-tidal and, and tidal communities. And so using that sort of background study, we, we wanted to use these indicator species and sort of build a sort of a, um, an aggregate, if you will, of impervious or importance value um, 
totals for tidal species, sort of indicators of tidal species. In this case, this, uh, the, the equation down here is uh, swamp tupelo, bald cypress, sweet bay, and cabbage palm. These were, again, not exclusive to tidal, but good indicators of tidal conditions. And then we also have indicators of non-tidal wetlands in this area. And so water tupelo, Geechee tupelo, uh, overcup oak, and uh, water oak, in this case, were used as our sort of non-tidal. So we, we basically just added those up and for our survey work related to these um, 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 tidal reaches. And if we plot those and look at them across these river reaches, you can see the East River sort of maintains a pretty consistent level of tidal species. It sort of maintains that tidal um, composition. There's a little bit of non-tidal that comes in here. Um, but the St. Mark's had a very different pattern. And you can see that, again, when we get to that middle range, um, we, at the very bottom, we're dominated by tidal species, essentially no non-tidal. But the non-tidal do come in here um, halfway up our, our, our study reach on the St. Mark's River. And taking that one step further, we can plot those, those tidal and non-tidal importance values and look at how they compare to that long-term 30-year uh, mean daily salinity that we modeled for, for each station. And so the interesting thing here is that um, if you're looking left to right, um, you can see that when um, the tidal swamps are less than 0.2 parts per thousand on average, long-term average, that we the tidal and non-tidal composition is pretty mixed. But once we get past that 0.2 parts per thousand, we have a very good separation between our tidal and non-tidal species composition. So that may be an important threshold there. I see Kim is there, so I know my time's just about up. Um, I can leave it there because I just wanted to mention, oh, you know, that we're kind of moving forward um, with um, using this information to also maybe make some um, um, projections based on hypothetical river flow and, um, and sea level rise to see how conditions might change in these uh, tidal swamps in the future there. So I will skip over sort of my conclusions and, and and kind of wrap up there. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, do we have time for questions, Josh, or do we want to do that in the Padlet? Um, yeah, I'm not seeing anything currently. Uh, nobody has a hand raised or anything in the question box. Um, since we're kind of tight on time, um, yeah, just uh, put it on the Padlet or drop it in the box uh, during the next presentation. Uh, I'll make sure you get answers. Uh, I, can I just mention one last thing? So this paper just got accepted. It will, it will be coming out in um, estuaries and coast, hopefully in the next couple months. Great. Thank you for uh, joining us today and sharing that information, Chris. Thanks for having me. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Paul Thurman with the Northwest Florida Water Management District, and he will be talking to us today about enhanced data collection efforts for Apalachicola Bay and St. Joseph Bay. So I will turn it over to you, Paul. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, as Kim said, my name is Paul Thurman, and I'm the program manager for the Minimum Flows and Water Levels Program at the Northwest Florida Water Management District. Today, I'm going to be talking about a rather large and interdisciplinary project that the district is part of, uh, consisting of some of the coastal waters that are potentially hydrologically linked to uh, St. Joe Bay and Apalachicola Bay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start off by talk, by describing some of the different water bodies. Um, Apalachicola Bay is just one water body that we're dealing with here, so I'm going to um, kind of put some perspective on some of the bigger system um, that people may not be as familiar with. And then I'm going to go into some of our uh, goals to what we're doing and our specific data collection efforts that we're working on. So I'm going to start off with St. Joe Bay. Um, I'm starting off with St. Joe Bay because that's kind of what started driving this whole project. Um, so St. Joe Bay is located in Gulf County up in the Florida Panhandle between Apalachicola Bay and St. Andrew Bay. Uh, it's a fairly large bay. It measures at approximately 42,500 acres in surface area. 
And this bay is different from a lot of other bays in the state uh, for several reasons. Uh, one is that development around the bay is relatively limited. Mm -hmm. The largest concentration of people in the area is the city of Port St. Joe, which has an estimated population of just under 4,000 individuals during 2018. Um, there's also some development around the rest of the bay, um, but that's fairly limited compared to that. In addition, unlike a lot of other bays, there are few natural surface water inputs into the bay, which makes it tend to be relatively saline. Um, while there are a few natural surface water inputs, uh, some tidal creeks and things like that primarily, the Gulf County Canal, which I'm going to discuss next, is a man-made water conveyance which has the potential to transport large volumes of water into the bay. Uh, despite the relatively small amount of development around the bay, multiple areas of concern uh, have been arisen in recent years. Many residents have reported changes in seagrass density and coverage, including increased algal coverage over the seagrass beds. Another area of concern is coastal development and land use changes, which we'll talk about shortly. Um, and while the area has shown limited development compared to other areas, development is happening. And finally, changes in water quality associated with the bay, primarily things like nitrate. Um, so the Gulf County Canal, uh, was completed in 1938 by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as a project to help improve navigation in the area. Um, because it was used for navigation, the canal is quite large. It has a mean lower low water depth of between six and nine feet and an average width of about 300 feet. So it's a pretty sizable, um, sizable canal. This canal connects two water bodies, St. Joseph Bay and the Intracoastal Waterway. The canal itself measures five and a half miles in length and provides for easy and quick access from Port St. Joe to the Intracoastal Waterway and then subsequently over to St. Andrew Bay or Apalachicola Bay. The canal is straight. Um, it doesn't have any curves. It also has few surface water inputs. Um, and it also has a large unconsolidated shoreline along a lot of its length, which is made up of spoil associated with the canal construction. Little development exists along the canal outside of the city of Port St. Joe. Um, so basically right by the bay, you get some, some marinas and some industry and things like that. But once you get upstream in the canal, it's primarily natural shorelines. Now, there are concerns from stakeholders in Port St. Joe and some of the surrounding areas that are concerned about the health of St. Joe Bay. And many of these individuals feel that the Gulf County Canal may be facilitating large freshwater inputs into the bay, uh, which are resulting in some of the adverse changes to the bay uh, that they're seeing with seagrasses and, and things like that. Um, now the Gulf Intracoastal Canal was completed in the late 30s, early 40s, around the same time that the Gulf County Canal was, also by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, this also was created for navigation uh, specifically as an inland waterway for barges and shipping to help allow for safer navigation through protected waters so they didn't have to be out in the Gulf. This Gulf Intracoastal Waterway um, extends about 1,100 miles from Brownsville, Texas, all the way to Appalachie Bay. It provides a 150-foot wide, 12-foot deep channel. Now, of this 1,100 miles, approximately 38 miles of the Intracoastal Waterway lie within our study area. And that 38 miles is basically the distance between the East Bay portion of St. Andrew Bay and Apalachicola Bay. Now, as you can imagine, due to the size of the Intracoastal Waterway, the potential for water transport among basins does exist. Um, however, as we're going to describe here in a little bit, the volume, direction, and quality of water that is possibly being conveyed through these canals is currently unknown. Now, along the intracoastal waterway between the Gulf County Canal and Apalachicola Bay lies Lake Wimico. Lake Wimico is a fairly large lake. It measures about five miles in length, and the width is somewhere between 2.2 miles at its widest and less than a mile at its narrowest. Lake Wimico also contains about 14 miles of shoreline and covers more than 4,000 acres of water. Overall, the lake is relatively shallow with typical water depths ranging between three and five feet. However, the Intracoastal Waterway was excavated right through the middle of this lake, um, as you can see there. 
So even though you've got shallow water on either side, right through the middle of the lake, you've got this 300 foot wide, 12 foot deep channel. In addition to the, the intracoastal waterway, there are multiple small creeks which feed into Lake Wimico. Um, it can also provide an unknown volume of fresh water into the lake. Um, now, one thing I haven't mentioned is that even though Lake Wimico is classified as a freshwater lake, um, Lake Wimico and all of the water bodies that I'm talking about here are all very heavily influenced by tides. So there's a lot of surface water elevation changes um, and potentially changes in flow which are associated solely with the tides. Okay, next slide, please. Um, now on the southeastern end of the intracoastal waterway within the study area is the Apopatacola River and Bay. Um, now, I'm assuming everybody here is quite familiar with Apalachicola Bay and the river, so I'm not going to go into any details regarding it. Um, but the important part here is that the Apalachicola River intersects with the Intracoastal Waterway about six miles upstream from where it meets into Apalachicola Bay. Uh, recently, some local residents are reporting that flows from the Apalachicola River are being diverted through Lake Wimico into St. Joseph Bay through the Intracoastal Waterway and the Gulf County Canal. Um, although these reports have not been verified with any specific data collection efforts um, using any sort of updated scientific flow modeling methodologies or anything like that. And on the northwestern side of the study area, we have East Bay. Now the East Bay I'm referring to here is the portion of St. Andrews Bay, not Apalachicola Bay. Um, so want to make sure that's clear. We don't get confused with that. Um, so St. Andrew Bay is up near Panama City. Um, around this East Bay, there's multiple sub watersheds that feed into the bay and include Watapo Creek, Sandy Creek, and Little Sandy Creek. Recent aerial imagery shows that over the past decade, uh, multiple land use changes are occurring in the land surrounding East Bay. Primarily what we're seeing is that silviculture and pine forests are being converted into cattle pasture. And this is not just around East Bay, but this is also in between East Bay and the Gulf County Canal as well. Now these changes have become increasingly evident and are accelerating following Hurricane Michael. Um, as we've all talked about before here, the area around St. Andrew Bay was heavily impacted by Hurricane Michael which made landfall in October 2018 as a category five storm and destroyed huge areas of forest all the way from the coast here around St. Andrew Bay and Apalachicola Bay, even all the way up into Georgia. Um, now, while this is often the case with specific types of land use and changes, water quality in the system is suspected to be changing as well. So currently Sandy Creek and Little Sandy Creek have been listed as impaired for bacteria and fecal coliforms and dissolved oxygen respectively. But um, as we said before, due to these potential conveyances, we don't know, you know what the long-term changes are in the water quality and where that water may actually be flowing. Now, as I've stated before, uh, there exist reports of flow from the Apalachicola River through Lake Wimico, through the canals, and into St. Joe Bay, and possibly even St. Andrew Bay. Um, and we do know that the potential does exist for this water to flow across watersheds uh, due to the canals that are there. However, detailed verified flow information currently is unavailable. What we do know and the information we do have consists of the National Hydrography data set. This data set, which is depicted on the image on the right, indicates that flows in general tend to move from St. Andrew Bay and East Bay through the Intracoastal Waterway into St. Joseph Bay, again, still through the Intracoastal Waterway through Lake Wimico and into Apalachicola Bay. In addition, we found two hydrodynamic models, which were developed uh, quite a few decades ago, which deal with this specifically. And both of these models indicate that flows are most likely moving in this direction as well. An additional model simulation that we found indicated that East Bay may be largely isolated from the rest of St. Andrew Bay with little hydrologic connectivity. Uh, so freshwater flows flowing into East Bay may not be moving into the rest of St. Andrew Bay, but would be diverted through the Intracoastal Waterway towards the, the Southeast. Um, 
Now, like I said, these are modeling reports that were conducted several decades ago, um, sometimes 30 years or more. So we don't know much about how these models were developed. We don't know whether actual flows were measured, um, when those flows were measured, um, how these models were developed, how they were calibrated, uh, if they were verified or anything like that. Um, so we need to take these reports with a, with a grain of salt. These reports are also in contrast to what we're hearing from the residents um, in areas like Apalachicola and Port St. Joe, which state that water is flowing from the Apalachicola towards St. Joe Bay and St. Andrew Bay. Now, determining the flows and volumes across an area like this presents a lot of challenges um, in doing that. So historically, these issues would be looked at using an individual watershed for something like water quality. So if you were looking at St. Joe Bay, what was happening with the water flowing into St. Joe Bay, you would look at just the St. Joe Bay watershed. Um, but what we're seeing is that if some of these reports are true, then we may not be able to make that assumption anymore. So in order to start investigating the extent of the hydrologic connectivity among the tri -bay system and to help understand the volume, seasonality, and quality of water flowing through it, the St. Joe Bay Water Quality Initiative was initiated. This initiative consists of multiple state and other agencies, nonprofit organizations, and any other group really um, that gathers regularly. Right now we're meeting about quarterly or every six months. And the purpose of these meetings is to promote data sharing and collaboration. Um, so all the groups involved in this are those who collect data and have interest in St. Joe Bay. Uh, many times you might have multiple entities that are all working in the same system towards a similar goal, um, but we operate independently of one another and little collaboration can occur. So the main goal of this initiative is to identify data gaps which are impeding our scientific progress and figure out ways to gather that data. Uh, maybe somebody else is already gathering it. Maybe it's, it's a big data need that we need. Um, it's also a good way to develop cross-agency relationships with people who may have different areas of expertise and jurisdiction when it comes to state agencies, and to help expand our areas of interest and knowledge by sharing data. So in the first few meetings of the St. Joe Bay Water Quality Initiative Working Group, uh, several areas of lacking data were identified in relation to the areas of concern we discussed previously. Within St. Joe Bay, um, and really the entire Bay system, we found that we had virtually no idea of how much water was flowing, if any, through these systems, through the Gulf County Canal, into the Bay, through the Intracoastal Waterway. Um, so no data was available regarding how much fresh water was flowing, any seasonal fluctuations, um, how upstream boundary conditions in the Apalachicola River with high flow versus low flow, the downstream boundary conditions, um, winter low tides, summer high tides, storms, things like that. We didn't know how any of that was affecting um, what might be happening in there. Within East Bay, we found that limited information was available concerning water quality of the tributaries. So Sandy Creek, Little Sandy Creek, and Watauga Creek that I mentioned earlier, or how any of these ongoing land use changes may be affecting water quality. Um, in addition, to make that even worse, we had no idea of any sort of detailed flow information to determine where that water may be going. Finally, we observed that no information existed concerning freshwater flows between the Apalachicola River and St. Joe Bay. Um, and very limited information was available concerning salinity patterns and conditions in Lake Wimico. So one area that we really had a lot of concern come up in had to do with Lake Wimico shifting from a freshwater lake into a saltwater, a more estuarine habitat. So to begin answering these questions, the Northwest Florida Water Management District, in cooperation with uh, primarily the Department of Environmental Protection and the USGS, has developed a series of projects designed to begin answering some of these major data gaps that we just talked about. Um, next slide, please. So the first set of projects are designed at beginning to get a handle on any sort of flows within the basin. Um, as I previously mentioned, we know virtually nothing about it. Now, but because of the, the way the area works, numerous challenges, such as the location um, in the Gulf County Canal, we had the unconsolidated sands, 
um, very few roads along the Intracoastal Waterway to access to the tidal impacts. Uh, things like that made collecting discharge information extremely difficult, um, and to be honest, much more difficult than we we anticipated. So because of this, we had to consider several different methodologies, um, including the establishment of some continuous discharge measurement stations, and also using a series of tidal cycle ADCP measurements. Sorry, are we about out of time? Okay, um, so we're collecting a lot of discharge information to get an idea there. Um, we are also collecting salinity data in Lake Wimico to see the vertical stratification throughout the entire year, um, which will pair up with our freshwater flow data. And um, we're looking to collect and analyze this data through at least a year. Um, then we'll see what kind of conclusions we can draw from the data, how do they relate to the observations that we're seeing, um, and identify target areas for additional research, restoration, and things like that. And the data collection is ongoing, and hopefully next year we'll be able to provide you guys with some, some really detailed information on what's happening in the system. Um, and with that, just want to thank all of our partners, uh, USGS, DEP, our contractors, um, and everybody with the Water Quality Initiative. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us this morning and for sharing information on the project. Um, in an effort to stay um, on time to get to lunch, if you have any questions for Paul, you can check out the Padlet. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Morey with Florida A&M University, who will be presenting on impacts of river discharge variability on coastal and shelf water properties in and near Apalachicola Bay. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to um, get to present in this, this wonderful forum. So I am with Florida A&M University um, School of the Environment, and I also serve as a distinguished research scientist for the NOAA Center for Coastal Marine Ecosystems. And I was previously at Florida State University, where I did a lot of the work that I'll be showing today. And I'd like to start off by acknowledging um, NOAA for um, sponsoring some of this work, as well as for the DEP, the NAS NASA Ocean Vector Wind Science Team, and um, Triumph Gulf Coast and the APSI initiative to FSU. Okay, so um, I'm sure everyone is familiar by now with the uh, the Apalachicola River and its watershed, but I just like to look at a, a, a map briefly here and show that this watershed extends, you know, through much of western Georgia and up north of Atlanta. It's um, the largest freshwater source in the Gulf of Mexico, east of Mobile Bay. And the geography of its drainage area is going to have some implications um, on some later material that presents about the climate variability. And then this um, picture that pops up is just to prepare us for the second part of my talk after I speak about climate variability and the impacts of salinity in Apalachicola Bay. This picture suggested that there is a link between Apalachicola Bay, the Apalachicola River discharge, and water properties of the offshore Gulf of Mexico out over much of the northern West Florida shelf. So this is um, chlorophyll um, concentration is derived from satellite data and the brighter colors, the warmer colors show higher chlorophyll concentration. And you can see this tongue of high chlorophyll extending southeastward from Apalachicola Bay. So there's a suggestion that Apalachicola Bay has a profound influence on the water properties and even ecology of the northern West Florida shelf. And that'll be the second part of my talk. So first I'd like to look um, at the climatology of river discharge from Apalachicola River. So this is a diagram, we call these often box and whisker plots for those who aren't familiar with them. And if you look at the, uh, the thick black line between the yellow and the blue colors, that is the median river discharge for each month from this about 80 year data set. Um, then the lines between the different colors show you the 25th percentile, 75th percentile, and then the um, the 10th percentile and 90th percentile at the bottom of the top. And the lines show you the extreme values um, for each month for any of this time period. And you can see that there is a um, general higher flow in the late winter and early spring and lower flow and less variability in the summer. And there's flood events that can happen during any year. They're typically due to large scale rain systems in the winter and spring and fall and tropical systems during the summer. 
And if we look at similar distributions, but instead of month by month, year by year, uh, over a long time frame, you can see quite a bit of variability um, in the discharge from one year to the next. The medians of the daily flows can vary over 300% from year to year. And there's also some of these extended time periods of wet and dry conditions or high and low river discharge rather. So if we take the anomalies of the river flow from their climatology that I showed earlier, run a smoothing over them and plot them, you get a time series that looks like this over the last approximately 80 years. I've color coded these anomalies based on ENSO phase. So ENSO or the El Nino Southern Oscillation, most of us know is a phenomena that occurs in the tropical or the equatorial Eastern Pacific Ocean. Um, we have warmer waters, which correspond to the El Nino or warm phase, or colder than normal waters, which correspond to the La Nina or cold phase. So even though this is a tropical Pacific event, it has um, climate implications all around the world and strikingly in the Southeast United States, that's important to us. What we can see here is during, in particular, the later decades, there is a striking relationship between ENSO phases and the river discharge anomalies, where warm phases are more often associated with high discharge events or time periods, and the cold ENSO phase is more commonly associated with low discharge events. During some part of this time record, this relationship breaks down, for example, in the 60s and the 70s. Nevertheless, if we look at the average monthly flows departure from climatology based on ENSO phase, you do see a strong relationship, particularly in the winter and early spring months. If we look at March, for example, you see that during an El Nino or warm phase, you can expect uh, almost 20% greater flow than average during that month. Whereas during the La Nina phase, about 13 or 14% less than average. Now, we did see some time periods where there was a breakdown in this relationship, and there's been some evidence in the literature that this may be a result of interaction between ENSO and some longer time scale climate modes. For example, here I'm plotting in the blue line the uh, Atlantic multi decadal oscillation, which is derived from sea surface temperature or pressure uh, anomalies over the Atlantic. Ocean. And we see during the 60s and 70s, we entered a negative AMO mode. And this also corresponded to the time period where you had less of a strong relationship between ENSO and river discharge anomalies. There also is some suggestion of a hint between the long term river discharge anomalies uh, over multiple decades and the AMO. However, we're only looking at one cycle here, really, in this plot. And it's just too little to, to derive any, any conclusions like that. Um, some groups are using climate models to extend um, aesthetic record, if you will, to look at this relationship and the dynamical reasons behind it. So now if we look at salinity as measured at cap point and dry bar, and instead of subsampling them based on insophase, we're simply going to subsample them based on river flow uh, regime. So the blue curves in each of these monthly plots represents the the salinity data corresponding to high flow conditions, so the river is in its highest 20th percentile of flow, whereas the red is when the river flow is in a low flow regime, and the green is for all time periods. And these are probability distribution functions or cumulative distribution functions for salinity. So as an example of how to read this, and this comes from a paper published with my colleague Dmitry Duhovskoy and JTEC Oceans in 2012. So if you're interested in really digging into these data, um, you can ask me and I'd be happy to provide you with this paper. But as an example, if we look at July um, on the left of the plot here, and there's a little blue line that I drew to, to indicate this. The way you read this is during high flow conditions or when the river flows in its highest 20th percentile, there's a 40% chance that the monthly average salinity at cap point will be below five parts per thousand in July than during normal conditions, or, or not normal conditions, but any given year. Um, so about 5% chance during any given year. If we look over at March on the upper right, you know, we're looking now at low flow conditions. So we can see that there's a 35% chance of the monthly average salinity at dry bar being above 30 during low flow, during low flow conditions. Whereas in any given year, there's only about a 
percent chance of the salinity being that high during the month of March. So we can see that there is a very strong relationship between, of course, the salinity at different locations in Apalachicola Bay and the river flow. Now these are look, that, that was looking at longer time scales of salinity variability, you know, monthly time scales. What I also found in doing this analysis is that there's a significant relationship between the river flow regime and the high frequency variability at different locations. So here we're looking at a time series of salinity for the month of October for a particular year at Cat Point. And the little wiggles are tidal frequencies. So what you can see here is there was some time periods where the salinity, the, the long sort of slow mode of uh, salinity at Cat Point was high up around 30. And you can see these tidal wiggles are quite small. There's not a lot of intraday variability in the salinity. When the salinity is high, it stays high all during the day. But when the salinity went lower to around 15 or 20, you can see that these, these wiggles or these departures during the day became much larger, maybe as high as 10 parts per thousand. So what's happening here? And you can see this in the picture of the right. Those of you who have spent a lot of time on the bay have probably seen this before. You're getting these tidal fronts where they're coming together of fresh water from the river um, and saltier offshore water combined at these fronts and the fresher water is usually more turbid and you can see it by color change and there's also convergence at the surface and you can see it by um, a foam collecting at the surface. So what happens is these tidal fronts when you have um, the river discharge at stronger it actually moves these tidal fronts to the location of some of the observation locations in this case Cat Point such that these tidal fronts will move back and forth. So we can look at this in another way by looking at the intraday salinity range, which is shown by the gray lines, uh, the thicker gray lines in this bottom plot, compared to the sort of long, longer term average salinity shown by the thin lines. And you can see a strong negative relationship between the two, such that when the salinity is higher at cap point, the intraday salinity range is lower and vice versa. When the salinity is generally lower at cap point, you're going to get a larger amount of variability within the day due to tides. So we've been talking a lot about the salinity within Apalachicola Bay and its relationship to the river flow and climate influences. Here is an animation. It's hard to control on the screen. I hope, I hope it's working on all your screens. I've noticed some animations aren't working quite so well over this uh, platform of salinity from a numerical model. This is um, not the model we're using for the ABC, but it was sort of an uh, intermediate model that we were developing. And you can see the colors represent salinity. Blue is lower salinity. You can see the low salinity water at times is expanding out over the northern West Florida shelf. It's moving around a lot. This is not tides, this is wind forcing such that the wind is coming out of the northwest, which happens behind a cold front during this time of year. It'll actually move this lower salinity water offshore quite far. Now, this northern West Florida shelf is particularly important to a number of reef fish, you know, grouper in particular, other fish that spawn at the reef edge. They're um, around this time of year, actually, and their larvae find their way to the near shore uh, seagrass beds. The larvae are moving through these intermittent plumes, which are carrying um, nutrients and increasing primary productivity and perhaps changing the food source of the food availability for some of these uh, reef fish larvae. So it's important to understand the connection between the Apalachicola River and not just necessarily the bay, but the ecosystem that's important to the region outside of the bay. So I'm going to look at focus on two different time periods and these were the 97 98 uh, winter and spring time period which happened to be an El Nino year which was very high flow year for the Apalachicola River. You can see the um, the blue line is the actual measured discharge rate and the red line is the climatology so it was much stronger in especially in this February March time period. And then the following year there was a La Nina and the river flow went into an extended dry period see throughout the entire year on the right hand panel the river flow was lower than climatology. So these are the two time periods I'm going to focus on as representative wet and low years. So if we look at satellite chlorophyll or satellite derived <clears throat> chlorophyll concentrations out over the West Florida shelf 
during these two time periods, first looking at this wet year, we can see that there are elevated chlorophyll concentrations over much of the West Florida shelf. So the red colors indicate higher than average and the blue colors will uh, represent lower than average. Now we can see it around most of the coastal areas. A lot of the rivers in the region have similar variability. So if Apalachicola is flowing strong, Suwannee is probably also flowing pretty strong over long time periods, vice versa. But one thing that we can see here is sort of a tongue-like pattern of high anomalies extending southward from the Apalachicola River region. Now, if we go to the next year, which was a low flow year, we can see that the anomalies reverse and they become negative anomalies. And again, you see this tongue-like pattern of the negative anomalies extending from Apalachicola River. The little white box down there in the lower panel is a region where I'm going to be showing time series from. So first, let's look at uh, the, the correlation between river flow and uh, precipitation out over the western Georgia region. So we can see, as would be expected, when you have higher precipitation over west Georgia, you have higher river flow. However, this correlation is not always high, very high throughout the year. It's most strong during the late winter and um, spring months. You can get correlations between precipitation and the river flow as high as about 0.9. Whereas in the summertime, it reduces to about 0.7. Now, one of the reasons for this may be because what influences the precipitation is different with the different years. This time of year, as we just had a big rain event yesterday, um, if it rains here in Florida, it's probably raining over Georgia and most of the watershed, right? But in the summertime, you can have local rains contributing fresh water in the lower part of the watershed in Florida on this sort of daily convective activity basis. Whereas you can still have very dry conditions over most of Georgia. So Florida can be wet and Georgia could be dry in the summer. But it's usually not the case um, during the winter and spring that you get this dichotomy between precipitation in Florida and uh, much of western and northern Georgia. So we know now that there's a relationship between the precipitation over Georgia and the river flow. And there's also some suggestion that the river flow is influencing the offshore uh, environment. And we can see this in the chlorophyll. So if we look at departures from normal, normalized by a standard deviation, of chlorophyll, shown by green, the river flow rate, shown by blue, and precipitation over Georgia, shown by purple, you can see a striking relationship. Such that interannual variability in chlorophyll in these offshore conditions, in the offshore areas, seems to be linked with variability in the Apalachicola River discharge and precipitation over the larger region. So if we look at the calculate a correlation actually between the satellite derived chlorophyll and the river discharge, we can see a pattern emerging where you get the same type of tongue-like pattern extending southward from Apalachicola. So the data is showing that this is happening. So how is this happening? Well, I'm going to use another model experiment to show this. I'm going to, so basically what we're looking at here is the salinity from a larger Gulf of Mexico model. And in this case, you can see this plume extending southward from Apalachicola. The wind is blowing it there. And on the right, you're going to see the difference in a model forced by the wet year's river discharge or the dry year's river discharge. And can't quite get my mouse to go on. There it is. There's the animation. You can see you can see that as the wind blows the river plume out over the West Florida shelf, it's also transferring the salinity anomalies out over the West Florida shelf. And I can see a picture of someone up here, so I'll be wrapping up very soon. And if we average those anomalies, we can see again this tongue-like pattern. This is showing us the region of influences determined by the model of the Apalachicola River over the West Florida Shelf. So you can see it's not just confined to the bay, but rather extending 150, maybe 200 kilometers offshore. And looking um, similarly at the, the satellite image or the comparison the satellite data showed before, you get the same tongue-like pattern. The difference is with the satellite, you're getting the influence of the other, other rivers, whereas with the model, it's able to isolate just the Apalachicola River. So to put this together in a conceptual diagram, the Apalachicola Chattahoochee Flint River system is acting like a conduit for transferring climate signals over, over the watershed, so terrestrial climate signals over western Georgia, actually, to the marine ecosystem of the northeastern Gulf of Mexico. 
So the precipitation affects the river discharge variability, which affects the variability of nutrient fluxes out over the shelf, affects primary, product, uh, primary production. And then the high chlorophyll or the organisms are transported with the river plume by wind-driven transport and influences the variability of phytoplankton abundance offshore. And a uh, remaining question is how does this affect higher trophic levels, you know, including fish larvae, for example. And I will leave up the summary slide um, as we're nearing the end of the time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, don't currently have anything popping up, um, but I could just give um, a couple more seconds because I feel like every time I say there's nothing in the box and close it out, someone, aha, there it is, George Ackerman. All right. How can we keep informed on this research? Well, I'm going to be extending some of this research with uh, a newer model, and we saw some some hints of that in an earlier talk uh, this, this afternoon, or this morning, rather, um, looking further at influence of Vakwachkola River, not just on those two points where we had observations before Cat Point and Dry Bar, but elsewhere in the bay. And that model will also be looking outside of the bay. So through the ABSI, um, material that's put out for consumption. Um, is there a website uh, that you know off the top of your head that people could get that information? Um, as we'll be moving forward, that'll be put on the data products for APSI. Um, but I'm happy to provide any of the papers. This Most of the material I presented here comes primarily from two different papers. I'd be happy to provide those to anybody upon request. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, that is all Thank I'm seeing. You. Thanks. Thank you for joining us this morning and for sharing that information. Um, so now we're going to take a lunch break. We've shared lots of uh, great information in the last two days. There's more to come. So please plan to come back and join us for some more exciting presentations on the research being conducted in our area at one o'clock. Um, another uh, big thanks again just to all of our presenters for sharing their research and we will see you back here at one. Don't forget to check out Padlet if you have any further questions or you can put them in the chat box. So we'll see you back here at one. Um, up next we have Jason Garwood and he is the um, head of our research section and he's he's been with the reserve for many many years. Um, wealth of knowledge and he's going to talk to us about uh, long-term ecological monitoring highlights and changes in the Necton communities in the Northern Gulf of Mexico estuary. So, Jay, take it away. Can you guys hear me? A little louder would be good. How about that, is that better? <clears throat> I'm still pretty weak. Um, that's about the best I can do. <laughs> that sounds pretty good on my end. Okay, all right, um, so thanks. And uh, just welcome everybody for you know joining us on this first symposium. Um, let me see if I can. Okay, I can control the slides here and everything. Um, so yeah. Um, so the the results presented herein were part of a of a long term um, monitoring effort that we've been uh, doing for the past about, about 20 years. Um, you'll notice there's actually three different RCs on here out of, out of a total of four that have been RCs at the time. So um, this is this is a long-term thing that we've been doing and, and are planning on continuing to keep up for some time. So much of the previous work investigating Necton communities was conducted by Robert, Robert Livingston and colleagues. A similar study that he did was published back in 1976 uh, that, um, looked at seasonal changes in, uh, in seasonal and spatial changes in nectar assemblages, and then he was able to relate the abiotic fluctuations that drove those changes. However, the study only encompassed about three years worth of data. Um, he did go on to publish more studies, for example, one in 1982, um, where he looked at trophic organization, and um, in 1984, he developed an estuarine profile for the bay. And then in 97, he was able to relate trophic responses to the um, communities um, related to changes in the river flow. So we got documentation already that these things are related. Um, we just, we don't know if these things have changed over time. And one thing we knew, do know, for example, is that multi-decadal water quality data that, you know, we know these temperatures are, are getting warmer and the frequency and severity of these um, 
low flow events are increasing. So just uh, taking a look at some of the, the water quality that we gathered during the study. Um, if you look at the top left to the right, um, we can look at seasonal water quality. Um, typically, Apalachicola Bay has uh, um, your usual you know, warm summers and low temperatures during the winter. Um, your base entities, you know, those tend to follow similar to what temperatures do. And then um, the absorbed oxygens are usually negatively correlated. Typically, that's following on um, that carrying capacity of oxygen with temperature in the bay. Um, from the bottom left to right, we look at a spatial perspective. Um, temperatures are usually fairly consistent throughout the bay. However, um, salinities typically um, increase as you go farther from the river and dissolved oxygen tends to um, be highest during, um, at the lower portions of the estuary. So to date, there's been a lot of work done in the bay and the majority of the fisheries related work has focused on subtitle and intertidal oyster populations. However, there have been a few studies published on necked and community structures since the time period from the 70s and 90s. And that's not because there's a lack of data. For example, we've been collecting these data since the summer of 2000. And our colleagues over at FWC have been doing this since 1998. Um, it's really important that we continue to investigate community structure in these systems because um, they're directly related to ecosystem function and that's directly related to the success and sustainability of our fisheries. So understanding these interactions contributes to the resilience in our estuarine systems and should be one of the first steps in learning how these communities might respond to a disturbance. So, Having the data already available and a lack of more re recent published studies, uh, we wanted to utilize our reserve data to reevaluate three uh, separate questions. And first of those is, are we able to identify seasonal and spatial patterns in that community structure? And then if so, are there any environmental variables that can explain the patterns that we're seeing within that structure? And then to take it to the next step, we want to look at the, the role of freshwater inflow and how that plays in driving the patterns in our community structure within the bay. Okay, so for sampling methods, uh, we use a 16-foot outer trawl that has a one-inch mesh, and that is that modified with a one-eighth inch uh, cod end at the, at the end of it. Um, historically, we've sampled 13 sites. At each site, we take five toes per site, that, and each of those uh, are two-minute toes. Um, we field ID as much as we can down to species, and uh, everything we can't ID, we take back into the lab and use microscopy to do that. Um, we measure the first 20 of every, every species to the first milliliter, unless there are two size classes at which we then go down to 10 each. And everything is, that's left over is then enumerated by species and size class. So before I get into some of our results, I just want to spend, oh, actually, um, let me back up here. I forgot to talk about sampling methods here. So as far as water quality, uh, we sample salinity, clarity, um, dissolved oxygen, temperature, cloud cover, turbidity, wind, uh, waves, and river flow. And everything here with a star um, is, is denoting what we've used for our statistical analysis. And then, um, so again, data were collected over a 20 year period at 13 sites. Um, from 2000 to 2012, we sampled monthly at 12 sites, and then from 2014 to present, we sampled quarterly at nine sites. And what we did was we wanted to um, only use sites that we were sampling consistently over the consistently over the 20-year period. And what this ended up doing was uh, giving us sort of a northeast to southwest transect along the axis of the bay um, here. So. Before we get into our results, I, I do want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, a rationale for the statistics that we used here. Um, so uh, ec ecological data tend not to fit well into the parametric universe uh, for hypothesis testing, uh, mainly because these tests require that our data meet specific assumptions about distribution of the underlying population. And usually that typically assumes that, you know, means and other descriptives are taking the shape of that normal distribution. Um, as opposed to non-parametric routines, which you know make few or no assumptions um, and often don't worry about how those um, those data are distributed. As a result, we're not really held to the restrictive assumptions that those data need to be normal or random and independent, and that the variance is equal without throughout the data set. So, in other words, these multivariate data 
are able to um, work in multiple dimensions, um, meaning that there's a whole bunch of X variables and Y variables. So it really makes better sense to use sort of um, statistics that um, we can, that are robust to that sort of uh, data structure. So to do that, we, uh, we use a program called Primer, um, which is a point and click statistical package designed specifically for marine ecologists to handle large uh, multivariate data sets. Uh, these routines don't limit the user to the assumptions I've already discussed, and they allow us to adjust for the complexities of ecological data. So not only can it handle many species and variables considered at once, but it can also adjust for data that have changing and relative abundance. So if you look at this uh, species table over here, one thing you can tell is there's a lot of samples, many species, and lots of zeros that are here, and then it's interspersed with large positive values. So what we can then do is instead of assuming a distribution of the data, we're just allowing that to take whatever distribution it has. And then this allows us to basically produce these dissimil dissimil dissimilarity matrices. And from there, we can determine our level of significance using randomization and permutation. So using the routines that we're discussing here in, um, we're going to address each of these hypotheses. And then, um, so the first is, are we able to identify season and spatial patterns in community structure? So to do that, first, we're going to use multi-dimensional scaling, which provides a visual technique uh, that allows an easy way to uh, show the relationships between communities. For example, if we look at this MDS plot of our raw data here from this study, um, what you can see is um, each triangle, you have basically these triangles and squares, and triangles and squares that are closer together indicate um, communities that are more similar, and then those that are farther apart are more different. And so what you can see here from this particular plot is potentially there could be as many as you know, three different communities within this, this data set. And typically what we would expect is that to occur across some type of gradient, some environmental gradient, we usually expect that to be be the reason for that. So once we have the visual or the visual gradient that we think might exist, we can then move to use PermaNova, which is much like a non-parametric form of the general linear model. It has the ability to deal with factors, groups, and treatments in the experimental design, uh, as well as evalu evaluating any interactions between your factors. And in this case, our factors are going to be site and season. And then next, uh, to find out if there are any environmental characteristics that can explain the patterns that we're seeing, um, we're going to use something called a best routine, which statistically matches the biotic and abiotic patterns and it determines linkages between one or more communities and those environmental variables. Um, and from there, it can select a variable or a suite of variables that can best explain the variation that you're seeing in your biological data. Um, so for example, if you look at this MDS plot over here, um, we see that there's potentially as many as five different communities and through the best routine we can we can determine that you know using salinity it does a pretty good job of tracking those changes within those communities and then finally to address whether or not there are any environmental characteristics that explains i'm sorry i'm, I'm going back to me um, actually finally to determine the role that uh, freshwater inflow plays in driving these we're going to actually move into east bay and to do that, we're going to um, compare um, years that had uh, both wet and dry years. And we're going to use MDS to uh, look at the visual representation of these East Bay sites. And then we're going to use something called a similarity of percentages um, that will get us an idea of how those exactly what species are driving those changes that we're seeing, if we see any at all. OK, so a little bit of our results. Um, we captured a whole total of 187 species during that, uh, the, the 20 year period, and 139 of those were fishes and 48 were invertebrates. Um, here's a table of the 30 most abundant that we had captured. Um, one thing to note is one is that, you know, these are dominated by fishes, and also that, you know, we were able to quickly reach nearly 100% cumulative abundance within just our first 10 species. So, you know, these, are, these species are really what's dominating a lot of, of our catch. And thus, you know, it sort of affects how we up or down weight to look at our rare species. So for results, if we look at season um, based upon our, these community structures, um, what we see is there are potentially four different um, communities based upon season. 
However, um, the biggest difference was actually between the summer, fall, and winter, spring seasons. So those actually is what we see the biggest differences within our community structure over that, those, those seasons. However, from a spatial point of view, um, we actually see um, three different communities. And those communities follow that northeast to southwest transect that we had talked about. So here we have stations eight through 10, which are related to East Bay. Then we have four, five, and seven that are found here in the Mid Bay. And then three and six that were located down here along the Barrier Island. So to evaluate these MDS patterns, um, we used a two-factor permanova. We looked at season, region and the season by region interaction. And the results showed that these were significantly different at all levels. And what that tells us is that these communities were different depending on both the time of year that we sampled and what part of the bay that we sampled. So from here, we then evaluated which variables best explain that variation uh, using uh, temperature, salinity and oxygen. The interesting thing about this, this results is that we ended up finding that uh, oxygen had the best um, solution for our model, followed by temperature and oxygen, and then uh, temperature, salinity, and oxygen. And the fact that oxygen provided the best solution for our model is likely not because Nectin are actively seeking out the environment based upon that variable. Um, we would argue that it's more likely that it's because of the intercorrelation of oxygen with temperature and not the actual driver of the structure. So, you know, recall I said that temperature varied by season, but not by region. So, you know, we're suggesting that temperature is probably this main driver of that seasonal variation. So, you know, the remaining variable being salinity suggests that that's the variable that's likely driving a lot of that spatial variation that we're seeing in these communities. We should also point out that um, this analysis would probably improve if we were to incorporate bottom type as a variable. Um, we know we know bottom type is important for Necton. Um, and having the knowledge that these you know, southern bay stations here, three and six, are, are quite different. Um, they're dominated by sandy sediments um, and also are, have extensive seagrass beds. And, and we know that those grass beds survive there because they have the least amount of influence from the river. So actually, I'm going to back up. I can just move on. It's no big deal. I just, you know, I, I ended up rerunning the model because um, we originally had tried to put river flow within the model, and we were having issues with the way river flow entered into it and was causing some issues. And we were able to get much better resolution when we just used temperature, salinity, and oxygen, and then used river flow as a, or salinity as a proxy for river flow. And we can talk about that later. Um, so just moving on. Um, um, for our results, looking at the impact of river flow on these communities, um, what we have is um, we, we decided to just compare the, these wet years versus these dry years, and we were able to, to use two consecutive years, um, 2011 and 2012, um, that were notoriously, they were, they were long consecutive dry years as opposed to 2018 and 19, which were, had more consistently higher flows. And so we thought we could just compare these and see if we could see any differences between the communities. And if we look at our water quality, what we see is um, temperatures were somewhat consistent except for the 2019 year, which was significantly warmer. Um, and then salinities here during the dry years were, were significantly higher than they were during the wet years. And we compare these um, on an MDS, what we see is um, these wet and dry years, uh, there's difference upon all four years, but there's also a difference between the wet and dry years. Okay, and so if we look here, we have a, um, a table here with our similarity of percentages routine. And so one of the things that you'll notice is first, um, we have um, a decrease in species richness during the wet years, but also it's important to note, um, if you look at our relative abundances, we see that the relative abundances during these wet years goes up for every species um, consistent with between the two tables. Um, with the only exception that being Lyosum xanthurus here in the spot. Um, another thing to notice here is that we have to look at uh, Calonectes sapidus, which is our blue crab, and then Lytopinatus citiferus, um, the white shrimp. Both of these um, are, you know, commercially are, are important fisheries species. Um, and so what this can kind of suggests to us is that, you know, even though we may see a lower richness during these wetter years that, you know, it's it's the drier years comes at a cost of a lower relative abundance of these species that are using that that habitat regardless of the flow regime. 
So just to wrap it up, uh, we found a significant uh, seasonal effect in our water quality, and these effects could be identified within those nectar communities. Temperature was a predominant factor driving those seasonal changes that we saw, uh, and because juvenile recruitment into the bay is temperature dependent, uh, we feel it's important to highlight implications for climate change, uh, as we expect to see you know, ocean and bay temperatures increase. Um, also, these climate-induced effects may also be translated by changes in weather patterns and possibly changes in flow, increased severity of storms and drought events. Um, salinity was a good predictor of variation in the spatial aspect, and this was highlighted by changes that we saw in, in yeast bay during the drought and wet years. Um, as a result, those reductions in flow may have caused an increased species richness, but that may yet be at the cost of these lower abundance of nursery-dependent species in the bay. So this potentially has important management implications for the maintenance of these sufficient flows to support those species. Um, bottom type wasn't used in our model, um, but is probably another important driver of these stru the structure of communities within Apalachicola Bay. And you know, this just kind of highlights the fact that you know it's really important that we continue to maintain these long-term data sets and continue to to analyze the data that are in them. Um, and so with that. Um, I will um, sort of give you a pre-introduction to our next speaker, Kara Allen, who um, is our um, NERS Margaret Davidson Fellow, and she'll be taking these up to the next le level by constructing a spatial temporal model using these data. And thanks. Great, thanks so much, Jay. Um, yep. Give a couple seconds, see if any questions pop in the box. Um, I think we're at 20 after, so let's move on to Kira and maybe they can okay. put it in the, in sure. the chat. Okay, Sounds next, as, as Jay mentioned, we have Kira Allen, and she is our Margaret Davidson Fellow here at the Reserve. We're really happy to have her. She's a student at the University of Central Florida, and she is going to talk to us about the effects of changing salinity regimes on Apalachicola Bay food web dynamics. Okay. All right. Um, I'm assuming you can all hear me. Um, Yes, yeah, we can so, hear you, and the slides are coming up. Okay, cool. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I've really been enjoying the talks I've heard so far, um, so it's nice to be part of this sort of thing. Um, I'm Kira. I'm a biology master's student at the University of Central Florida and part of the Lewis Lab of Applied Coastal Ecology. Um, I'm also ANIR's first Margaret A. Davidson Fellow, um, and that's been a great experience so far. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about the work I've been doing for my fellowship and thesis research looking at the effects of changing salinity regimes on the Apalachicola Bay food web. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, Apalachicola Bay is highly diverse and productive and supports populations of many fishery species. It once supplied 90% of Florida's oyster harvest and 10% of the national oyster demand, and still supports other popular fisheries such as shrimp, blue crab, and menhaden. Now, there's a potential for large-scale salinity changes to occur, which could significantly affect the species populations and food web dynamics of the system. Today, I'll be focusing on three species in particular, white shrimp, blue crab, and menhaden. These species are known to be economically valuable as well as being ecologically important by representing different levels of an estuarine food web. Examining the changes in the biomass of these species in response to salinity changes helps give a glimpse of how the overall Apalachical Bay food web may be affected by altered salinity levels. There are a couple of issues driving salinity changes in Apalachicola Bay that my project takes into account. Um, the first is that of freshwater reduction. Apalachicola River is the main source of freshwater to the bay. Um, and I know we've already mentioned this before. Um, the, there's an ongoing Supreme Court legal battle over the ACF River Basin, um, which Apalachicola River is a part of. Um, Georgia has proposed a heavy amount of freshwater diversion upstream. And if this proposal goes through, Apalachicola River flow will be historically low which would significantly alter salinity in Apalachicola Bay. Reduced freshwater input has been a major factor in the decline of Apalachicola Bay oyster populations, uh, which has led to the closure of the oyster fishery in recent years. Um, if these sort of changes continue to occur, there could be consequences for a lot of other species as well. 
The other issue is sea level rise. Um, now we all know global sea level rise is an ongoing issue that will affect many parts of Florida, including Anir. The map on the top there uh, shows what two meters of sea level rise would look like in the area around Apalachicola. In Apalachicola Bay, sea level rise will result in changes to salinity levels and habitat distribution. When combined with reduced freshwater input, Apalachicola Bay would experience a significant salinity increase. There's a need for more research on the ecological consequences of such salinity changes, uh, particularly in regards to the effects on species populations and trophic dynamics. There are a good amount of previous studies examining how salinity shifts affect Apalachicola Bay. Oysters in particular have received a lot of attention with studies reporting that these salinity changes have been detrimental to oyster populations and that a decline in oyster health can go on to hurt the populations of many other species that rely on oyster reefs. A reduction in freshwater input has also been found to result in lower zooplankton productivity and reduced primary productivity. Having less productivity at the base of the food web can carry up to affect many of the higher trophic levels. In regards to our three species of focus, studies have reported that white shrimp suffer indirect negative effects of high salinities because this change leads to an influx of more salinity tolerant predators. And for blue crab and menhaden, both rely on low salinity areas for healthy juvenile development. In regards to the Apalachicola Bay region, most of the studies uh, tend to focus on oysters or primary productivity, so I was interested in examining how species from other levels of the food web respond to salinity changes and tying this into the bigger picture of what it could mean for overall food web dynamics and ecosystem productivity in Apalachicola Bay. Ultimately, the question I aim to address is how will freshwater reduction and sea level rise affect the Apalachicola Bay food web. The big picture for my research is that I'll be using a coupled hydrodynamic and food web dynamic modeling approach to simulate salinity changes, which will provide an ecosystem level analysis rather than species specific and contribute more information on trophic dynamics. The models will be constructed using ANIR's two decades worth of biological and environmental monitoring data. The Davidson Fellowship supports me for two years, and I'm about half a year into it at this point. So the big overarching project is still in fairly early stages right now. Um, but today I'll be providing a small scale example to give a snapshot of some of the changes we might expect to see in species populations in response to shifts in salinity. I chose to focus on menhaden, blue crab, and white shrimp because these are some commonly found species in Apalachicola Bay that hold commercial value and represent different levels of the food web. I examine trends in the biomass of these species over time, along with Apalachicola Bay salinity, and built generalized linear models to predict future changes in species biomass based on a scenario of heavy sea level rise and freshwater reduction. These are plots depicting Apalachicola Bay salinity and the biomasses of white shrimp, blue crab, and menhaden over the past 20 years, um, based off of ANIR's water quality and trawl survey data. The graph on the top left shows salinity, which you can see appears to be showing a slight decrease in recent years. This coincides with higher levels of Apalachicola river flow in recent years, which supports the idea of river flow being a major driver of salinity in the bay. Looking at the trends in species biomass, um, all three species seem to be showing a bit of an increase in recent years. These increases appear to coincide with the decrease in salinity, so it's possible that lower salinity conditions are beneficial to those species populations in the bay. Now, these are trends we've seen over the past 20 years up until the present, but what about the future? As I mentioned earlier, predicted changes in freshwater inflow and sea level could seriously alter salinity levels in the bay. So I wanted to get a sense of how these three species might respond to such changes. In order to do this, I used generalized linear regression models and tested out different distribution families and different combinations of terms to use. A total of 13 models for each species were tested and the winning models were chosen 
based on a combination of low AICC values and meeting all normality assumptions. The resulting best fit models are listed here. I applied a scenario to these models to represent sea level rise and river flow reduction. I used the two meters of sea level rise uh, by 2100 prediction given by the IPCC, but only like looking at up until the year 2050. So I applied a gradual linear change in sea level up until then. So the actual sea level rise by 2050 ended up being about 0 0.7 meters. Um, and a visualization of that is shown in the map there. The reduction in river flow to 5,000 CFS is a number that's been proposed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers as part of the negotiations with Georgia upstream to divert more fresh water. I also applied this as a gradual linear change up to the year 2050. I then used the models to calculate the changes in species biomass over time in response to these changes in river flow and sea level. These graphs show the modeled predicted changes in species biomass as a dashed line, along with the previously observed uh, biomass numbers as points and in the graphs on the bottom row here. We can see that white shrimp and blue crab are predicted to experience a decrease in biomass while menhaden show an increase. It's interesting to note that the most informative models for white shrimp and blue crab only took river flow into account, while the Menhaden model only incorporated sea level. This is interesting to compare with what we saw in the observed species biomass and salinity trend plots earlier, where all three species appear to be increasing. There's a close relationship between river flow and salinity in the bay, so it makes sense that white shrimp and blue crab biomass would respond strongly to reduce river flow. For Menhaden, it appears they're more sensitive to a rise in sea level rather than reduced river flow. Um, it's possible that Menhaden benefit through some of the other factors associated with sea level rise, like increased depth, which would result in greater, greater habitat availability for Menhaden. Um, now, as far as modeling approaches go, the one I used here was a pretty simplified one. Um, in reality, there's a lot more factors that can be taken into account, like changes in habitat type, nutrient levels, species distributions, etc. This small-scale approach focused on individual species populations, and while these species might represent different le levels of the food web, we don't really get a sense of the interactions between them. But like I mentioned before, this analysis was meant to provide a small scale snapshot of some of the species changes we might expect to see. For the big picture analysis, I'll be diving more into the food web interactions of these species, along with others, in order to get a more holistic sense of how the Apalachicola Bay ecosystem responds to changes in salinity. For my overarching research project, I'll be using a coupled hydrodynamic and food web dynamic model for Apalachicola Bay. I'm collaborating with researchers at Tulane University to adapt an existing Gulf of Mexico Delft 3D hydrodynamic model to represent changes in hydrological conditions in Apalachicola Bay. I'm building the food web model myself using Ecopath with Ecosim and Ecospace. By coupling these two models, the food web model will display temporal and spatial changes in species dynamics in response to input from the hydrodynamic model. I'll be running a series of salinity change scenarios through the models based on various Apalachicola river flow conditions discussed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and based on historical data, along with the IPCC global sea level rise predictions. The results will be represented by shifts in species abundances, and distributions due to salinity and hydrological changes. This modeling approach will be able to incorporate changes in other environmental conditions as well, like habitat distribution and water temperature. Looking at temperature and species biomass patterns presents another interesting point of analysis because Apalachicola Bay has seen an increase in water temperature over the past few years, um, which you can get a sense of in that graph there. Um, and the other advantage of this modeling approach is that it will give a picture of how the overall food web may be affected by environmental changes, and we'll be able to analyze more of the dynamic interactions between different species rather than focusing in on specific populations, as has often been done in previous research. 
Another component I'm incorporating into my project is stakeholder engagement. My research has a lot of implications for the broader Apalachicola community and organizations involved with it, and I'd like to build a discussion about the issues my project addresses. I'll be utilizing ANIR's various connections through the Coastal Training Program and other reserve sectors to organize meetings with stakeholders such as representatives from NOAA, FWC, other researchers, and the local community. This will be done through a series of personal interviews and online survey methods used to assess observed or perceived environmental and biological changes in Apalachicola Bay and understand potential future implications of these changes. These interviews will allow me to address specific stakeholder concerns and incorporate local ecological knowledge into the model, um, something which isn't typically done in a lot of ecological modeling studies. In terms of my research progress so far, I've processed all 20 years worth of ANIR's trawl monitoring data. Um, some of you may have seen me out on the more recent trawls or in the lab, um, because I've been collecting samples of species to take length and weight measurements from, which I'll be using to refine the measures of species biomass that I'll need for the food web model. I've developed a baseline list of species and associated parameters to construct the model and I'll be working to continually refine this as the project moves along. I've met with the ANIR sector heads about putting together a list of stakeholders who'd be interested in the project, and I'm in the process of developing interview and survey questions, which I aim to implement this spring. All right, last slide. Um, upon completion, this project will have a lot of broader significance. It will fill in some research gaps by linking environmental changes with trophic dynamics in Apalachicola Bay and provide an ecosystem level analysis. The results will contribute um, information on the implications of salinity changes for species relevant to fishing or conservation interests. Even just from the small scale analysis we saw earlier with white shrimp, blue crab, and menhaden, um, we saw pretty drastic predicted changes in species biomass over the next couple decades. These three species are all commercially valuable, so it's likely that reductions in river flow or an increase in sea level could seriously impact their fisheries. This project will also foster a collaboration between different groups so different stakeholders can have a say and incorporate local ecological knowledge into the modeling process. Um, also, the environmental issues facing Apalachicola Bay are relevant to many other estuarine systems. Um, so the project results and model itself will be useful for addressing similar situations in other areas. Ultimately, I hope my project can shed some light on the implications of pressing environmental issues facing Apalachicola Bay and provide results that have meaning for the broader community. Well, that's great. Yes, we hope they can too. <laughs> that'll, that'll be a wonderful addition. Um, yeah. Josh, how about if we put the question, Renee's question in? Um... Oh, uh, we have until uh, 140, don't we? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. So yeah, we have time to ask that one question. Okay, yeah. Um, so Renee, Renee Colini asks, are the drops in population reflective of perhaps crab and shrimp moving further up into the rivers or out of the bay? Or is this saying that the loss is from the entire system? Um, so this was, uh, the biomass is like averaged over like all the stations where the data was collected. So um, it's, try, it's trying to represent all the system, um, or at least like all the area that the stations cover. Um, and then I'm hoping with the, um, the food web modeling component, I'm doing a spatial model, so that'll really help um, give more information to how the spatial distributions of species are, cha are changing. Great, thank you so much. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands or questions just yet. Give it a second, because it always pops up as soon as I say there's nothing. All right, looks like we're good. Thank you so much. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you to you all. Um, I'd love to hear from you if you have any more questions. Um, I know there's some of you I'd love to talk to more, so just feel free to reach out via email. Um, but yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, we. That's what we hope the symposium will do: was connect everybody to uh, each other. Um, next up, we have Dr. Charles Jango, and he's going to tell us about. Um, an assessment of water quality and nitrogen bio extraction in North Florida aqua, aqua, aquaculture leases. 
Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? We can. Oh, very good. You sound okay. great. Somebody else was using a uh, MacBook earlier, and they mentioned that their webcam wasn't working, so I wasn't quite sure whether I would have similar difficulties, but everything seems good. Coming through okay. loud and clear, and we can see you great. Very good. Um, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a large uh, proportion of the uh, doctoral uh, work that one of my students did, and that's Mario Marquez. Uh, he was assisted uh, by a uh, master student with me, uh, Prion Vidal. Uh, Prion moved and uh, on to a different project, but did contribute to this one. And uh, uh, my collaborators, uh, Dr. Shohan and Patak, are, are faculty here at uh, FAMU, and, and uh, Suzanne Bricker is with uh, uh, NCOS in uh, at the Oxford Lab in Maryland. So um, let me see if I can advance yep very good well i went too far there we go um we've heard a lot today about oysters and uh oyster uh, re uh reef restoration oyster aquaculture but another issue in uh, a lot of coastal bays of course is eutrophication in the u.s it's estimated that uh maybe two-thirds of coastal waters have been degraded by excess nutrients from non-point source things, uh, urban runoff and agriculture, as well as direct discharges. And besides providing um, uh, a, a product for the consumer, uh, aquaculture, cultivating bivalve shellfish, um, can also serve as a nutrient management tool that can complement land-based management techniques. Oyster farms and, and natural oyster reefs uh, improve water quality because shellfish uh, filter suspended sediments and chlorophyll from the water and thus remove and sequester nutrients and improve water clarity. Uh, the removal of particulate organic matter also reduces the risk of hypoxia because you're taking the stuff that might decompose and draw the oxygen levels uh, down out of the water. So, in addition to sequestration in tissue and shell, uh, shellfish may also enhance denitrification with their uh, waste products and pseudofeces and contribute to a burial of nitrogen and sediments. And NOAA, in fact, recognized this uh, in their Marine Aquaculture and National Self Shellfish Initiative in 2011. They specifically uh, mentioned a goal is to conduct research on environmental factors that affect shellfish populations uh, like ocean acidification and pathogens but also ecosystem benefits provided by shellfish like water filtration and potential impacts of shellfish projects on adjacent habitats and resources so with that in mind the objective of, of this study was uh, to evaluate the potential capacity for nutrient removal by oysters um, with the growing uh, aquaculture uh, industry in Florida coastal waters. And to do that, we're gonna use um, a, an already established model called the Farm Aquaculture Resource Management Model, or FARM. And that provides a tool to estimate the ecosystem service of nitrogen removal um, with the input of certain parameters, and I'll go over those in a few minutes. And a secondary part of this was to um, look at the oysters, not only as, a, as an organism, but also as a community. Oysters have an associated microbiome, uh, a complex um, ecosystem, if you will, of microbes that live in and around the oyster itself. Um, and these potentially can contribute to some of these ecosystem services, including nutrient cycling. So, Here's our study area. It's not in Apalachicola Bay, but it's next to it. Um, this is an oyster bay, which is uh, part of Apalachee Bay. It's off uh, the coast near Panacea. Uh, you can see the Oklachne uh, River mouth uh, right there at the bottom of the map. This particular area is, is an aquaculture lease zone, uh, and we heard about those yesterday from um, the state ac aquaculture folks. Um, Tallahassee Community College uh, operates the Wakulla Environmental Institute, and they have an oyster aquaculture training program. 
and they maintain a research lease in this area and there are also uh, multiple uh, commercial oyster growers in here so we worked with the tcc folks and some of the local oyster growers uh, to gather some of our data this area is considered healthy and stable in terms of eutrophication there was a, a national estuarine uh, assessment in 2007 and overall the water quality looked pretty good generally low eutrophication status the area has uh, quite a bit of seagrass and a moderate amount of oyster reefs. The actual aquaculture area, of course, is, is not seagrass, uh, but uh, there, there is some in the area. Um, an older paper by Castro et al. Uh, looked at the nitrogen inputs into this system and estimated them to be something on the order of uh, a bit over 7,000 metric tons per year, 21% um, per agriculture and 61% from upland forested regions. So there, is, there are some uh, substantial nitrogen inputs into the system. So for the sake of uh, this study, we grew oysters. We started with uh, uh, seed. Um, initially, there were uh, 11,000 diploids and 9,000 triploids maintained separately. Uh, aquaculture in this area is off bottom. Uh, cage culture. In particular, uh, the technique here was called Australian long line, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. Some of the growers in the area also use floating cages. Oysters were sampled bi-weekly uh, over a period of about 450 days, 2016-2017. Uh, at each uh, sampling point, we collected uh, individuals, diploid and triploid, uh, brought them back to the laboratory and did a variety of size measurements to record growth. Um, we also analyzed uh, shell and tissue samples for uh, elemental analysis, nitrogen and carbon. So we want to get a handle on how much nitrogen is being sequestered by, by these shellfish. And uh, as I'll talk about a little bit later, um, we also looked at the microbiome associated with these. So this is uh, what the lease sites look like. Uh, you can see the uh, floating cages. Uh, as the oysters grow, uh, they're thinned out in, uh, into progressively uh, larger cages. Uh, uh, the uh, water chemistry was monitored routinely uh, on a biweekly basis, uh, give you some idea of what the conditions look like there. Salinity averaged about 23 PSU, you know, with a range of 16 to 28. Uh, chlorophyll A was roughly seven milligrams per liter, particulate organic matter almost 11, and total nitrogen somewhere around 0.8. So um, a good, nice environment for oysters. The salinity is, is right, and there's plenty of things for them to eat. So this is what the growth looked like. Um, this is plotting both diploids and triploids over time uh, during the experimental period. And you can see in the photo at the bottom that uh, you know both of them are growing to roughly two inch size uh, in a fairly short period of time, about 75 days for the triploids and uh, uh, about three months for the diploids. We're reaching three inch market size for the average oyster after about 300 days, 320 days, so roughly 10 months. And that's a fairly uh, rapid growth. Um, oyster aquaculturists in Chesapeake Bay and Long Island Sound takes them two years to three years to grow oysters to this size. The farm model that I mentioned before was originally uh, developed and, and parametized for uh, Chesapeake Bay, but it's also been applied to Piscataqua Bay in New Hampshire, uh, to some other uh, locations like Long Island Sound, but it's never really been applied in uh, semi uh, tropical waters, uh, warmer waters like we have here in Florida. And my collaborator in NOAA, Dr. Bricker, was curious to see if the, um, if the model would work under these circumstances. So we also, as I mentioned, measured oyster tissue nitrogen. Um, here you can see a graph of uh, uh, tissue nitrogen in the soft tissue, the meat of the oyster, and in the shell of the oyster. Uh, plotted separately, again, for diploids and triploids. No significant difference in um, shell nitrogen uh, with ploidy, but there is a difference in uh, soft tissue uh, nitrogen uh, between diploids and triploids. 
And you can see that the uh, nitrogen concentration, of course, increases as the oyster grows, as the tissue dry weight increases. So what's going on is the uh, diploids, uh, once they reach a, a certain size, tend to have a higher nitrogen content than the triploids do. And that makes sense if you think about what the triploids are doing. Proteins and fats vary in carbon and nitrogen content. Proteins, of course, have a higher nitrogen uh, ratio, and fats have a lower or no nitrogen in them. And uh, triploids, oysters, uh, tend to be fattier. They develop more weight because they develop more fat, and that contains less nitrogen. So for a given size, less protein, more fat, less nitrogen. So here's what the farm uh, model looks like, uh, sort of in a, a conceptual uh, diagram. Variables that are input include things like uh, current speed, um, chlorophyll A concentrations, particulate organic matter concentrations. In other words, uh, what sort of food resources the uh, growing oysters have access to. Um, we're also uh, looking at uh, rate of oyster growth, uh, seeding density, uh, how many are, are placed uh, you know, per cage, uh, over what area, and so forth. And basically, the, the model combines biogeochemical, hydrologic, and oyster growth modeling uh, together. And uh, here's, here's just a, a quick look at some of the input parameters. The model allows for different types of uh, culturing, whether it's uh, uh, in water or on bottom. Uh, you can input the farm size. Well, because we were on long lines, it's very long and narrow, uh, a meter wide and 35 meters long for a line. Uh, the tidal range, the current speeds, which we measured, um, seeding density, uh, growth uh, period, the weight, the harvest, uh, the initial weight, the harvest uh, weight and length, the mortality, and so forth. So the, uh, the section on the bottom that, that's highlighted in, in the red-brown color are results from uh, Suzanne Bricker's earlier work uh, modeling nitrogen removal by cultured oysters in various environments, Great Bay, Piscataqua River, um, Long Island Sound, Potomac, Chesapeake. Um, you'll notice that the um, nitrogen removal per acre is usually somewhere around 70, 80, sometimes 100, in one instance way up to 400. Our results are in the top. Uh, the modeled and measured values. Well, the first thing you'll notice is that the modern modeled values are significantly higher, a lot higher than uh, ones that uh, Suzanne had gotten uh, for her uh, for her other locations. 1,400 and 1,200 uh, kilograms per acre nitrogen removal, respectively. When we actually measured the nitrogen in the oysters and uh, back calculated the amount that they would remove per acre, um, we got lower numbers that are more fitting uh, for her model values in, in other places. 145 for um, a diploids and 228 for uh, triploids. So what, what we got out of this is that the um, the uh, farm model is significantly overestimating nitrogen removal uh, in this uh, Gulf environment. Again, it was developed for Chesapeake Bay, for Long Island Sound, for colder waters with slower growing oysters. And uh, the model is gonna have to be reparametized and, and, and revised in order to uh, make it work in some of these other waters. The farm model uh, would have predicted um, a removal of uh, 183,000 kilograms of nitrogen per year uh, from, from the bay. Our observed value, when we scale it up, suggests that they're only um, removing something on the order of 26,000 kilograms of, of nitrogen. And that represents a small percentage of the annual watershed input. But aquaculture is still expanding in this area. So let me change uh, briefly and, and show you quickly what we found for the microbiome, and, and I'll wrap up with this. Oysters, of course, are filter feeders. They accumulate estuarine microorganisms um, into the mucosa. These can be potential pathogens like Vibrio, but they can also be beneficial bacteria that are involved in uh, nutrient cycling. So the structure and function of these microbial communities and how they're influenced by 
environmental conditions and how they vary over space and time aren't well understood. We sampled uh, growing diploid, triploid cultured oysters, as I said, as part of this study. We pool them uh, into groups of eight or 10 each month, separately by diploid and triploid uh, in duplicate groups. We extracted the DNA and did um, 16S mRNA amplicon based sequencing just to identify the microorganisms that were present and use standard uh, bioinformatics pipelines to identify uh, phyla and gene genera. So here's, uh, here's some of the results from the um, uh, microbiome analysis. Uh, first thing that you can see, just look at the diagram, diploids and triploids really aren't very different in terms of their microbiota in general. Most abundant are uh, proteobacteria, um, formicutes, uh, et cetera. Um, if you do a uh, bray curtis dissimilarity between diploid and triploid uh, by Permanova, the Venn diagram on the left shows you the overlap, no significant difference. But what we did see, interestingly enough, when we started to look at them over time, is the diagram on the right, where uh, there's a significant difference in dates. Um, and in particular, the fall of 2017 was significantly different in terms of the composition of the microbiota than all other um, seasons that we sampled. And, and that was kind of hard to figure out. And if you plot the uh, OTU richness, um, in other words, the species richness of the microbiota in the diploids and triploids, something very strange happened uh, around day 300. You can see that the diploids and triploids are tracking along nicely up to that period. And then they both uh, show a, a significant decrease in OTU richness. We don't know why this happened, but it did happen about the same time that Hurricane Irma passed through the area. And we hypothesized that uh, possibly major changes in salinity um, that accompanied heavy rainfall or a uh, tidal event that left the oysters high and dry for a while. The oyster growers in the area reported significant mortality right after this event. Um, something changed the microbiota. And because this was a, a, a one-shot chance event, Obviously, we haven't been able to replicate it or figure it out, but something to, to look for in the event of, of future storms. Um, so let me, whoops, let me summarize uh, that last part. No significant difference with ploidy, significant difference in microbial diversity. Interestingly, 75% of the microbes that were present, we could identify them to phyla, but not at the genus level. So some of these might be novel taxa. After the hurricane, uh, the community structure in the oyster shifted completely. It moved to lactobacillus and clostridium, which are associated with hypoxic conditions and stressful events. Uh, we're continuing work on the microbiome as well as on the farm model. Uh, right now we have a, an NSF grant to look at uh, functional genes associated with uh, nitrification and denitrification uh, in oysters, and that, that sampling is ongoing and continuing. So in acknowledgement, um, the students were funded by uh, NOAA through the older Environmental Cooperative Science Center. Uh, Priyan Vidal was funded through the uh, uh, Center for Coastal and Marine Ecosystems. We worked uh, with Tallahassee Community College and the Wakulla Environmental Institute. I want to thank them. And oyster farmers uh, Bob Danzi and Justin Morgan were, were great help in terms of helping us to acquire our samples. So uh, with that, I'll stop. And uh, thanks for your attention. See if you got any questions. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, we have a question in from uh, Dr. Martinez Colon, uh, who asked, um, was that an El Nino year, if I can recall from Maury's talk? Uh, 2017, that's a good question. I don't know. Okay, that's all Something we have to yet. But there, there was definitely some event there that, that caused a, a major change. And if, if it was be, due to the hurricane, it's it's quite a coincidence. <laughs> okay, um, that's all I'm seeing popping up. No hands up. Just we're gonna take a break here um, until 2.20. Um, if you notice the slide on the screen, 
If you would like to attend the climate change sea level rise breakout session that starts at 2.20, just stay on this webinar. If you want to attend the listed species uh, coastal habitat session, you'll need to sign out of this webinar and then go to uh, the URL on, on your left-hand side of the screen, copy and paste that in your browser, register again for that webinar, and then we'll, you'll be able to attend that. It's a, it's a little clunky, but that's our only option here in, in GoToWebinar. So thank you, Charles. We really appreciate your presentation, and we will see everybody back at 2.20. Hey, Anita. Uh -huh. um, that, that information for the breakout session is also in the email that Kennedy Hansen sent out this, this morning. And a little bit easier, you can click directly on the registration link. Yes, thank you, Jenna. I forgot about that. So and that's it's also great. in the questions box is if you scroll all the way up to the top. So multiple ways to find it. We'll, we'll get you there. And you could also raise your hand when you come back in if you if you just totally don't understand it. And we'll get you. We'll answer your question. All right. We'll see you back at 220. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon breakout session focused on climate change and sea level rise. And uh, I'm laughing because you guys see nothing behind me, but on the other side of my computer is Kennedy in front of multiple computers making all the magic happen. <laughs> so welcome back. And uh, uh, very excited about this session. Uh, this group I've been working with for 10 years now, and uh, there's there's lots of exciting things going on. And uh, uh, this afternoon is just a, a very small sampling of some of the great work that's uh, that, that's come out of this project, the ecological effects of sea level rise, and and then the second phase of the ecological effects of sea level rise. And uh, so first to, to kick it off, um, I'll uh, introduce the uh, the Godfather. I don't know if that's the right term, Scott, but <laughs> feels like that a little bit. Uh, Dr. Scott Hagen, who is at Louisiana State University, and and uh, he's going to give an overview of of the the Easler project and and uh, talk about ways and means of uh, assessing the effects of sea level rise along the Big Bend area. Take it away, Scott. Thank you, Jenna. Wish I could be there. I'll just have to give you an electronic hug. Awesome. We are very grateful for all of the support that Apalachicola National Estuary and Research Reserve has given us. And it seems like just yesterday we were celebrating 40 years of the ANR. What a wonderful accomplishment. So, I am just going to give a broad overview and try and set the stage for those that are really doing the leading edge of the curve work in Kareem Alazad and Diana Del Angel and of course Renee Collini and her out extensive outreach work. If you Take a look at the bottom of my title slide, you'll see what I like to call the coastal land margin of the northern Gulf of Mexico. The northern part of the colored area is about the 10 meter elevation contour. And then of course it extends out into the Gulf of Mexico. This has been our playing field for the last 10 years and we wouldn't be able to do the work that we have done to establish this capability of the coastal dynamics of sea level rise without the intensive work that Jenna and her crew have helped us to do in the Apalachicola region. You'll also note that I have an acronym CDSLR and again, that is the coastal dynamics of sea level rise, and you'll see that throughout the presentation. 
I want to begin by recognizing just some of the many folks that have been involved in our research efforts on the ecological effects of sea level rise in the northern Gulf of Mexico. And again, this spans over the last 10 years. And if you look at the science collaborators, those bolded in blue are the many different disciplines, just, just some of the many different disciplines that have been involved in our efforts. Clearly, we are doing interdisciplinary research and with the aid of Renee and Denise and Sonia and others, we have been able to achieve transdisciplinary research outcomes. And that's something that I think we're all very proud of because what that means is not only are we working to working with stakeholders to produce products that are useful to them, we're involving our stakeholders in our research process. And they have had a tremendous influence on the PhD dissertations. And so you'll notice the top five here PhD students and, and really these are the folks that are the change agents. These are the folks that are really taking the work that we've begun to the next level. And a couple of them are now assistant professors at universities. Matt is the latest being a, becoming an assistant professor last fall at the University of Georgia. Stephen has been for a year and a half now at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Davina has risen to the level of a research supervisor at USGS. And Kareem is, has been a research assistant professor and is now a contractor to USGS. And our latest, Deanna Del Angel, is going to present a little bit. And, and you'll see that the world is her oyster if you will. I want to, with my talk, establish this framework for the coastal dynamics of sea level rise. And I want to talk about this in terms of a low gradient, low elevation gradient coastal land margin system, in particular with respect to Apalachicola region and in general with respect to coastal land margins around the country and, and even around the world. And what I hope you'll see at the end of this session is that we have clearly extended this to include the evaluation of natural and nature-based features. So when I say coastal dynamics of sea level rise, this little animation gives us a and an idea, a, a cartoon idea of what, what we contend. Remember, 10 years ago, back in 2010, when we began this work in earnest, one of the goals that we had was to, de to demonstrate and to develop this capability to describe the complexity of sea level rise interacting at the coastal land margin. And this gives us an idea of the, an appreciation of the aspect of hurricane storm surge and how when we have rising sea levels, we're gonna have impacts that extend further and further inland. When we began back in 2010, we first needed to demonstrate that this was needed. And so some of the initial work that Peter Bacopoulos and I did in the Big Bend region and in, in the Apalachicola region was to simply examine what if we had one meter of sea level rise and we looked at the bathtub tide response. So what that means is we take the existing DEM and the existing baseline of the extent of inundation from the astronomic tide, and we raise the sea level by one meter, and we simply extend inland 
without any hydrodynamic modeling being done. And so then alternatively, we can look at this and we can say, well, what if we incorporate a dynamic tide? What if we raise the sea level and then we simulate the astronomic tide that will occur? And what this did is it opened up this recognition that it's a highly nonlinear process and it's very important to incorporate these hydrodynamics. What it also did is it opened our eyes to a recognition that in this region where we have a lot of inundation with just a one meter rise in, in sea level, we should have that in our baseline. And it made us scratch our heads a little bit about what's happening within that marsh system that's not being captured by the modeling approach. The same was demonstrated with bathtub surge. So imagine if you evaluated the extent, and it is in gray here as the baseline of the surge response that we see in this region, and then you just raise it by one meter and you say, okay, this is what we can expect in the future without doing any dynamical simulation. If we actually assess the hurricane storm surge, we see that, again, it's a highly nonlinear response. That is, it's not additive. It is a very dynamic situation, and it's very important if we want to understand risk in a, in a setting like this. What we also can consider with the coastal dynamics of sea level rise is something a little bit more complicated and something a little more natural and, and representative of what we see in, in a large portion of the Apalachicola region, and that is we have marshes. And recognizing that a marsh is going to respond to sea level rise very dynamically as well. It is going to try to accrete to keep up with the level of sea level rise. And if it can't, it's going to convert to open water. And at the same time, the saline waters are going to extend further inland and interact with freshwater species. And we want to be able to describe this dynamicism. We do so in of a somewhat complicated, but this process diagram really helps us to appreciate how we can begin to put all, everything together by integrating our models and producing dynamic results by using data that has been previously collected by doing our own field and laboratory experiments and by having the opportunity to not only examine different sea level rises, but different climate change scenarios and the impact that we're going to have on future precipitation rates and the impact that we have on other impacts, uh, other uh, products of climate change. Now, this region in the Apalachicola area, the reason that it wasn't inundated is because the model was composed or what was developed using bare earth LIDAR within the region. And that's one of the major outcomes that came from our earlier research is simply to establish that LIDAR data within these marsh systems is suspect. And if we want to build something as complicated as a marsh model, and Kareem is going to go into some detail on this, we need to be able to update that LIDAR within the marsh system. So LIDAR, while it is an incredibly useful piece of data, it's not necessarily the panacea that we all want it to be. It has its own uncertainties built into it. 
we put all of our models together and what we're able to do is we're able to model tides and hurricane storm surge throughout this northern gulf region and focusing particularly on the Apalachicola region and we rec we are able to describe the changes that we have in the marsh systems the creation of open water under higher sea level rise scenarios the evolving barrier islands and shorelines and dunes and the changing land use and land cover so that depending on the sea level rise scenario or more particularly depending on the different carbon emission scenario that leads to the sea level rise we have a different initial condition to run our hydrodynamic model on for the future another product out of our work has been what we characterize as what it's a wave attenuation toolbox and it's a tool that helps us to bridge this capability to assess economic impacts and to assess ecosystem ecosystem system services valuations again when we put our model all together what we were able to produce within the first seven years of of this project were one were uh, return period floodplains and here we're looking at the various one percent probability still water extents that are present day in light blue low sea level rise or 0 0.2 meters of sea level rise by the year 2100 versus intermediate low versus intermediate high versus high and recognizing again <clears throat> excuse me the non-linearity of this response so diana del angel is gonna show you how we've used those in terms of assessing the uh, consequences associated with those and making a connection to the natural and nature-based features something that i've been saying for 10 years that i read in an opinion piece way back then is this fact that sea levels are rising and the best we can do now is to manage the unavoidable un unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable I submit to you that unfortunately, we have not done a good job of avoiding the unmanageable in the last 10 years with our policy making. And so we have more unavoidable that we need to manage. Stationarity is dead. This is a recognition by USGS some 10 years, maybe 15 years ago. And what we've added to that is linearity is dead. In other words, we need to recognize that depending on the sea level rise that we're trying to assess, it's not just an additive response, it's a highly nonlinear response. We still need to understand the past to guide our future, and, and I would recommend a recent article in the Atlantic Monthly. Uh, could climate change be more extreme than we think? The historical record, especially the geological historical record, has a lot to tell us. One of the things that our project and, and many related projects have demonstrated is our numerical modeling technology that we have to play with these days is truly awesome. It, it's awe-inspiring to someone like me that's been working with numerical modelers their entire career that dates back over 30 years now from when I was an undergrad. And even though the modeling technology is awesome in those terms, it's still only good enough to use in the context of climate change and sea level rise as a diagnostic tool. But what it does tell us is that in these low gradient coastal land margin regions, we have a canary in the coal mine. 
especially in Louisiana, to be uh, honest with you, in terms of the relative sea level rise, the fact that we have such high rates of subsidence along with the sea level rise, and it serves as a canary in the coal mine. And what we've learned is that these impacts from the coastal dynamics of sea level rise will not come smoothly. We have been able to put together a lot of different models to describe a lot of different processes. And the work that we've been able to do in concert with the Apalachicola Natural Est National Estuary and Research Reserve is going to continue to lead the way forward. This is a coupling of overland models with marsh models, with bay and estuary and models, with our large scale tide and hurricane storm surge models. We've demonstrated that this can be done and we intend to advance this into the future. Finally, I wanna acknowledge our sponsors at NOAA, as well as NSF and FEMA and you may be interested in a new project that we've landed at, at LSU, where we're gonna be working with the US Army Corps, and I've provided a link to that. And if you are so inclined, Stephen Medeiros has recently put out a paper that I think could be quite useful to a lot of folks that are, are working on these types of problems. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Scott. That was such a great overview and 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 almost an impossible feat to do it within a short period of time. Um, and I and I wanted to say too, um, as we were developing this symposium, um, we we had a lot of interest. And um, as much as uh, we probably could have spent at least an entire day just talking about sea level rise and its impacts on Apalachicola Bay. Um, I had to had to give uh, other topic areas <laughs> a oh. chance to to be highlighted. So um, we're hoping that you know future symposiums we're, we're going to get to maybe pull in uh, some of the other uh, uh, project participants, um, some of your other amazing grad students. And um, uh, again, thank you so much. Um, and and there's one now. Um, love to introduce Dr. Kareem Alizan. Okay. Welcome, Great. Kareem. Okay. I have the control. Yes, sir. Okay. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Ainer, uh, for inviting me to talk about Marsh System and Apalachicola. Um, and that's what you see in the background picture here. Uh, I took this picture when I was a PhD student, uh, Scott mentioned at UCF under him. And um, I was I took this while I was collecting uh, GPS RTK elevation data with Steve uh, Majiros. I mentioned Steve's name. Um, I would like to acknowledge him um, as a co-author on this work, as well as my other collaborators, uh, Peter Bokopoulos, uh, Davina Passeri, and Scott Hagen. Uh, and I don't think uh, there is a need to uh, emphasize the importance of marsh and uh, modeling of marsh in such a microtidal estuary. So I got straight into the modeling, and um, I should say that this, um, this is a part of uh, a great modeling effort in Apalachicola, Big Ben region. Um, and uh, I will talk about the hydrodynamic model that we developed for that region. And then um, we'll focus on the coupled hydro MEM model, marsh model. And we'll show you some marsh projection results uh, using different sea level rise scenarios. Um, so uh, ABB, Apalachicola, Big Ben region, you see highlighted uh, red box in the map. Uh, in this region, um, it is two UTM um, 
zone and uh, it includes different type of estuaries, uh, river inflow, complex um, creek system, complex geometry, uh, topography, bathymetry and vegetation. And capturing all of these complexities um, needs a robust uh, descriptive high resolution hydrodynamic model. So um, we develop an unstructured finite element mesh for this hydrodynamic model. And it spans from 60 degrees west meridian in Atlantic Ocean, where it's forced with um, tides and spans over Caribbean Sea and Gulf of Mexico. And you see the um, high density of computational nodes in our focused area. And um, this includes the river, in this model includes river inflow, Apalachicola river inflow, and it includes more than 2.2 million computational nodes. And for a full tidal cycle, uh, using 1,000 CPU cores in high-performance computing, uh, it takes half a day to finish uh, the run. And um, one of the main inputs for, for these hydrodynamic models um, is the topography. And what you see here in this figure is um, the topographic representation um, of our hydrodynamic model. So the Brown area is, is highland and greenish is uh, where we have um, lower lands. And um, as Scott mentioned about the topography um, in the marsh system uh, with the LIDAR data, this, uh, this is a problem that uh, needs to be solved for marsh modeling. So uh, the other input that we have with the topography is, is the need to adjust um, topography in marsh platforms. So we use a machine le learning algorithm using uh, true elevation GPS RTK surveys that I just mentioned, we collected in the first figure I showed you. Um, we adjusted uh, the marsh platform there and um, all of these data are included in this topography that you see. Uh, so it is LIDAR, bathymetry data, and adjusted uh, marsh platform all over this region. And if we focus on this highlighted area, this red box, um, you can see how well this model um, ca captures the tidal creek system as well as the roads, you see these yellow lines and other topographic features. So um, to show you how the model is doing that, if we focus on this red box that you see here, um, this is the distribution of uh, computational nodes um, that we have in, in one of these focus areas. The distance between each, uh, between the two nodes in a, in a marsh system is somewhere between 15 to 20 meter. And that's why you see a smooth, great uh, topographic map uh, there in, in our hydrodynamic model. We run this model and uh, we used 18 gauges all over this region. And um, these results, these five boxes um, are just, um, showing some of them. And um, I can say all of these um, stations have the same type kind of results. So they are all um, in good agreement, the model results with the black line, which is the historic data. And we are so proud of this model. This is, um, this is a great achievement. And we are confident that this hydrodynamic model can provide us a good input for our hydro MEM model. Uh, the other important um, point here is uh, we have a very low tide range here when, when we are in this Apalachicola region. But when we go to the east side of the model here, we have higher tide range. And um, if we um, look at the mean high water, 
on, on this region. Um, in this figure, the uh, warmer color shows the higher water level. So you see a low water level here in, in the Apalachicola Bay, but when you go to the east side of the model, you have higher um, mean high water. And um, this adds to complexity of the modeling because the marsh um, that lives with this low tide range is different than the marsh that um, adapt itself with the, the higher tide range. Um, and I'll talk about um, this complexity and how we, um, we solve this problem. Uh, but um, keep in mind that we have a varying um, different tide range all over the system. So uh, we, we, to capture all of these dynamics and complexities that you see in the hydrodynamics and capture the dynamics of the, the dynamics of sea level rise, and Scott um, talked very well about that, we uh, developed this coupled model, uh, HydroMAM, and it couples hydrodynamic model with the marsh equilibrium model in a, um, to see all of the feedbacks between these two different type of modeling. So uh, this model has two main components of hydrodynamic and marsh equilibrium model. And the input for a hydrodynamic model, as you saw, is elevation, astronomic tides, uh, river inflow. And the hydrodynamic model gives input to marsh equilibrium model in, um, in the form of tidal constituents, uh, mean low water, mean high water, mean sea level, and MEM provides us with marsh productivity as well as how marsh respond to sea level rise by um, updating the elevation using accretion formulation in the marsh platform. So if we reach our targeted time, for example, if we um, do the simulation from 2020 to 2100, if we reach our targeted time, um, the simulation terminates output the results. Otherwise, we move to the next um, time step, uh, for example, five years, uh, and we have updated elevation here from MAM, and then we update our bottom friction using marsh productivity, and then sea level rise increment. And they all go again to the hydrodynamic model, and this feedback loop continues until we reach our target time. So uh, the one I talked about the hydrodynamic model. Uh, now I'm going to focus on the MEM part. So, okay. so MEM, Marsh Equilibrium Model, basically says that Marsh follows, Marsh productivity follows a parabolic curve. And the this parabolic curve input is um, elevation and tide range. And this elevation, marsh elevation and the tide range, and where it, the marsh elevation stands in the tide range uh, tells us about the hydro period. So hydro period is basically um, is where marsh platform stands in the tide range. And if it stands somewhere between low tide and high tide, we are on this red part of the curve, marsh would be very productive. But if we move to the right side of the curve, this wink and going to this low area of tidal flats, um, the productivity will be um, zero. And if we move to the left side, we move to the forested region, again, the productivity is less. The right wing of the curve shows where you see um, low marsh, and the left wing shows you where you see high marsh. And the other important thing are these constants A, B, and C. We planted and harvested marsh in any estuary to get this constants, which depends on tide range and other um, factors. But when you are modeling a big system that I showed you. You have a varying tide range low in Apalachicola to the higher in the Big Bend. 
you need uh, a better approach with these constants. So that's the, one of the main improvements in our model. So the constants A, B, and C are spatially varying now in the hydromam. So the, the point in Apache-Cola has a different parabolic curve for Marsh than a point in the Big Bang. So every point has a unique parabola based on the tide range and other factors in our model. So this is the first improvement. The second improvement is how marsh respond to sea level rise. Um, as we all know, marsh respond to sea level rise by absorbing sediment uh, and, in or and organic matter, inorganic and organic matter. Uh, but there are more to it. So uh, below ground organic matter uh, contributes into the accretion too. So our new formulation includes both inorganic and organic and below ground organic matter. So this is the second improvement in the hydro mem that goes into this, this modeling. So um, with this introduction about methodology, um, I would like to go to the um, results. So this is uh, Marsh projection results um, in this big system all ABB. Uh, and green area is where the mar marsh, um, our model is in agreement with National Wetland Inventory Marsh Coverage. Uh, and it shows more than 70% agreement, which is great for um, an ecological model. Um, so we are very confident about our results for marsh projection. And today I will focus on just Apalachicola, this uh, red box here, um, to show marsh projection for the future. And I'll show you two sets of results. One is marsh productivity that you see on the left and marsh type distribution. There are much more results, but today I, I'll show just, just these two. Uh, the, the left one, um, green area, shows high productive marsh, yellow medium, and red is low productive marsh, and gray is tidal flat region. And on the right side map, which is marsh type distribution, the red area is high marsh, blue is low marsh, and green is a transition zone. This transition zone can be both high marsh or low marsh, but the important thing here uh, these are these are the results for the current condition, 2020. Um, the important thing here is the dominant species here in Apalachicola is modeled as high marsh, which is Juncus here. High marsh is Juncus, and the low marsh um, is Spartina. And I would like you to focus on this region and the St. Vincent Island marsh projection. So, uh, if we uh, use sea level rise projections. I focus on two um, sea level rise projection, intermediate low, uh, which is 50 centimeter by 2100, and intermediate high 1.5 meter by 2100. So uh, we move um, through time. The first is 2040, and we are looking at marsh productivity. So intermediate low sea level rise scenario shows us the marsh will be more productive. This benefits marsh, um, eight centimeter of the sea level rise, both in, in the island and this area. Um, but if intermediate high sea level rise happens, 20 centimeter marsh, we, are, we start losing marsh here. Uh, lower productive, some tidal flats here in the St. Vincent Island. And if we focus on the marsh tide, you see a combination of both high and low marsh in Apalachicola region. So you start to see more Spartina um, if intermediate low sea level rise continues to happen. Um, and you see more um, uh, low marsh in the island, but what you see under intermediate high sea level rise is all low marsh and tidal flats. Uh, let's move to 2060. Um, with, even with intermediate low sea level rise, 
we lose, we start losing marsh, both on the island and Napaichikova. And with intermediate high sea level rise scenario, all would be mud flat, some uh, ponding and inundation even in the island. So from marsh type distribution, even intermediate low sea level rise scenario will be all Spartina. No marsh in the intermediate high sea level rise scenario. 2080, uh, we lose more marsh, more tidal flats under intermediate low sea level rise scenario. But here, intermediate high extended bay, uh, islands of tidal flats, and some marsh migration to the higher lands. Um, the marsh in St. Vincent Island, the current marsh, is all underwater too. From the distribution, you see both type on uh, for marsh migration here under intermediate high sea level rise scenario. And if we move to 2100, under intermediate low sea level rise scenario, uh, will be all tidal flat. But intermediate high shows a huge amount of marsh migration um, with the extended bay. And if you look at the distribution, you see both high and low marsh um, under intermediate high sea level rise scenario. So here I will wrap up uh, with uh, some conclusion, wetlands different, uh, respond differently, and we um, see marsh migration um, uh, under higher sea level rise scenario if um, the lands are restored. And the main important thing here is we need this interdisciplinary collaboration, different type of modeling work together to get the most accurate result that we want to see. And with that, uh, I would like to thank all of our funding agencies, uh, my collaborators, Apache Colon Nerd, um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, Kareem. That is really, uh, it's so amazing to see every single time. And, and I'm sure some of the audience are, are blown away by the amount of open water that we may see under higher sea level um, scenarios. Um, we're going to try to hold questions to the end, and then we'll have all of the panelists come back and answer questions together, if that is okay. So we'll move on to Diana. And uh, Kennedy's bringing up her presentation, and I'm fighting with the questions box that keeps trying to pop up in the middle of my screen. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, Diana Del Angel. And uh, Diana is a student at uh, TAMU Corpus Christi, and and um, we're so excited to have you today. And um, again, one of our Texas survivors, so um, just doubly appreciative of of you uh, being here. Yeah. And uh, so the title of Diana's talk is Economic Impact Analysis of Storm Flooding Under Sea Level Rise. So take it away, Diana. Thank you, Jenna, and I'm really happy I got to be here today. I've learned a lot about the Apalachicola system. And as Jenna said, yes, I am a PhD candidate at Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi. Um, some of my co-authors who have uh, been working with me on this project are listed here. Dr. Yaskowitz and Dr. Hagen are part of my graduate committee, and Dr. Uh, Matt Pilsky, who's worked with me uh, very closely in, in developing a lot of this. So I'm um, very thankful for those guys. Yeah, here we are. Um, so the, the motivation for for this chapter of my dissertation is, is really that, you know, some of the things that we already know is that coastal storms can cause significant economic and social impacts. For example, hurricanes like Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, each have cost over $100 billion in damages each. And with sea level rise, we expect that those, um, that the community assets, not only population, the built environment, natural environment, all that, um, the risk would be um, extended. And as Dr. Hagen mentioned, um, uh, the, the impacts of storm surge with combined with sea level rise are not linear and you know we wanted to make sure that we were incorporating this when looking into future scenarios and the hope really is that this kind of work can help community develop resilience projects and and just kind of get a glimpse of, of what 
you know, the potential future can can hold. And in this particular project, we are working um, with uh, two return period floodplains, the 100 and the 500 year floodplain, as, as Dr. Hagen had previously described. In these scenarios, um, and we're looking at five different scenarios for each of these floodplains, including a low, an intermediate low, an intermediate high, and a high sea level rise um, scenario. And so for each of these, um, not only do we expect that, um, that the floodplain may expand in area, maybe reaching further inland, but in places where the floodplain already exists, the depth of flooding is it's likely to be higher, and so the the increase in in damages or potential damages will be a combination of both of these um, causes. And as I've already mentioned, um, we are really building that one of the major inputs for assessing this um, economic damage is the floodplains that were developed through the predicting impacts of sea level rise in the Northern Gulf of Mexico project, which in include all those um, different landscape or land uh, marg uh, coastal margin interactions like the salt mar change, shorelines, uh, dune heights um, with each of these scenarios. So, so this is really impressive work. The primary tool that I used for assessing um, the economic impacts is HASUS. It's a GIS-based tool which helps us overlay not just where the storm surge is and where it interacts with uh, facilities, uh, buildings, uh, people, and it applies uh, a depth damage curve or some interaction to help determine what potential damages may be. The exception of these, and, I, and I'll, I'll go through the list of, of, um, of components of this analysis, the exception are roads and crops, those two were analyzed outside Hazus. So the goal of today's presentation is really to describe some of the, the data products, um, the data that is an input for these products, and I do want to go over uh, some results. Hopefully, as this data becomes available, you guys can go and play with it and and develop your own maps and and graphs and outputs and um, and learn something from it. The components of of this analysis include buildings and content losses, road exposure and bridge damages, crop exposure, damages to vehicles exposure of ex essential facilities and the number of displaced people and potential shelter needs. Um, those, uh, those top ones, buildings, roads, crops, vehicles, bridges, all that is also, um, also put um, summed up to develop what I'm calling a cumulative impact um, number. So all those numbers were summed up and um, we were able to look at some of what are the cumulative impacts are in the region. And these are summarized. Um, so for the regional approach, we use this hexagon grid to summarize all this data. Um, some, I mean, all these results. The, the outputs can be in point data. They can be lines, for example, roads are, are lines. Uh, they can be in, in uh, polygon shape. So collecting all this information in a hexagon grid was a good way for us to, to summarize and compare a lot of these results. And so I'm gonna start off by giving you a, a regional view of what some of results look like. The, the whole study area covers 15 coastal counties along the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And here you'll see this hexagon grid that we used as a summary. And when viewing the map at the scale, that hexagon grid really comes in handy and it helps us compare across this whole region. And the map that I'm showing you here is for the 1% that 
uh, annual chance um, floodplain. And it compares an intermediate low scenario, which is a 0.5 meter, to a present day scenario. And it's comparing the change in exposure. And basically what we see that the more dark red it is, it's areas where, where damage could double, you know, triple, maybe even four times the present day economic um, exposure. So some areas um, we can see like in Bay County, Gulf County have a lot of those red dots that, you know, maybe right now the the 100 year exposure may not be too high, but under sea level rise, we can see those numbers really spike. Um, another thing you'll notice here are these white uh, hexagons. These are areas of, of new inundation. And so these were not part of the original 100% um, 100 year full plane. And as sea level is changing, um, and uh, storm surge is starting to impact these areas. And on the bottom, I have a graph, just sort of a summary of that cumulative impact in billions of dollars for each of these counties for the present day and each of the four sea level rise scenarios. And this is also for the 100 year um, floodplain. So I'm gonna take a step back and talk about the individual components for um, the economic assessment. And one being uh, the building database. And the building database is something that is part of the Hazus um, uh, software. And it is um, summarized in general, um, I'm sorry, it's summarized by census block. And so, in, rather than having these individual points, we have polygons that represent uh, the number of houses in the type of housing that is likely to be present at these locations. Um, the general building stock is based on census population, the Bureau of Housing Information, um, and housing characteristics are based of energy consumption reports. And as um, when, when we look at the potential damage to buildings, uh, the costs are based not on val uh, current value or land value, but they're actually based on construction cost estimates. And the way that damage is related to flooding is through the use of depth damage curves and based on, on the of how much the depth of of inundation is has just calculates a percent damage of of buildings for the particular polygons and therefore calculates from percent damage what might the percent um, construction cost be another set of components are roads and bridges the road file um, was obtained from the US Census um, Tiger Line files. And we have included ramps, primary roads, secondary roads, and local neighborhood roads for this particular um, for this particular assessment. The road um, and we're calling this road exposure because there's not really a depth damage curve that we can apply to roads. So instead, what we have done is if a road is within the reach of of flood water, it is exposed and if it's exposed, it is likely that may need repair. And so we have used repair cost estimates based from the Florida Department of Transportation for mill and resurfacing um, costs, which are much lower than having to build you know, a whole new road. So, um, and for bridges, bridges are a data set that is built within hazards. It includes bridges that span more than 20 feet, but does not include causeways. And the damage, again, there is not a depth damage curve that is associated with bridges, and it's based on an expert opinion um, on a, you know, based on a probability of failure of, of different types of bridges.
Another component are crops, and these were mapped using the 2018 USDA cropland data layer. This is a satellite-based um, product. And, and similar to roads, we used a exposure approach where if the crop is exposed to floodwaters, uh, it is likely to have lost its value. And we used crop values um, by state, uh, the average value per state um, based from the 2018 um, land values from the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And, and here are the value per acres that we obtained from there. The critical facilities, facilities is not part of the, the uh, cumulative impact sum, but it is a separate uh, point file that will be available with this product. And it includes hospitals, police stations, fire stations, schools, uh, emergency operation centers. These are built within houses, but were enhanced using the USGS National Structures Data the data set, as well as a search through Simply Analytics businesses. And all these were, were adjusted for spatial locations and their addresses were verified using Google and Google Street View. And if you know we had to move these points, we did. Um, so just to make sure that you know we were working with accurate data. Similarly for water treatment plants, um, we also you know looked for them, Googled them and make sure that they were in the right location. These are built into the houses database as well. And they're either categorized as a small, medium, or large plant. Um, uh, there are some assumptions um, based on how the equipment is raised. Um, all equipment is assumed to be raised three feet, and that the threshold of functionality is four feet of water. And so the output of these files, the, the summary output that you'll see with not only the wastewater treatments, but the critical facilities is the percent damage, um, the loss in US dollars if available, and the likelihood that a facility would fun would be functional or non-functional based on that depth of, of flooding. And lastly, um, another data product that is, um, is going to be separate from the cumulative impact is the displaced individuals and shelter needs. And and this data is based on the US Census. It is integrated in the HASUS database. And the assumption is that if people do not have physical access to their property or may be disrupted um, by six inches of water or more, they're likely to have to temporarily leave their home. So we're not saying displaced people who will never come back. It's temporary displacement. and a portion of those may likely need to be sheltered within the community, and that is based on certain income and age factors. So to end my presentation, have a few minutes to look at sort of some snapshots for Franklin County. And you can see here in the, in the background, it's very light, but you'll see these hexagon grids um, that are outlined there. Here I'm summarizing building loss for Franklin County on the left side. This is in millions for the 100 year and the 500 year Stillwater floodplain uh, for each of the sea level rise scenarios. And on the right here is a map of Apalachicola, there's St. George Island and East Point. And within each of those hexagons, it is um, you know where we may find the most um, economic impact associated with building losses. And for this particular section, we see um, St. George Island having some high exposure of buildings to, um, to storm surge flooding impacts. Another example I have here are uh, roads and bridges on the right side. I have a graph that shows the exposure in millions for roads, the 100 year and the 500 year uh, scenarios. 
as well as bridge damage summaries for this is for the whole of Franklin County. And uh, my map here is not showing roads, actually. Um, this is showing total economic impact. Um, that was a, I put in the wrong picture on that one. But um, I would like to point out, though, that building losses and road exposure are some of the, the high ticket items across the whole study area. And so between those two components, they, um, they take up a, a majority of the portion of the total economic impact for considering the, the components that are in this project. And lastly, I'm showing here a displacement of people and shelter needs, again, for the section of Apalachicola, uh, East Point, and St. George Island, as well as the graph for all of Franklin County and shelter needs uh, for uh, the county as well, under the 100-year and 500-year scenarios. And I think it's kind of interesting here in Apalachicola, you know, under very low scenarios, that number stays pretty low. Um, and then there's sort of a threshold that, that gets passed and it, a lot of people become exposed after a intermediate high scenario. Overall, I think there's a lot of, of details that can be looked at um, with, with this data. It covers a lot of ground. Um, and we have 10 scenarios, you know, five for the 100 year and then five for the 500 year. Um, the data products will be available in these hexagon grids um, for the economic impact assessment and for displaced people and shelter needs. The critical facilities and wastewater treatment plants will be available in point files. And I'm currently working um, to try and identify, you know, what other um, files may be useful for people um, to 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 ex, uh, assess or be, have access to. Um, hopefully, this data will, you know, maybe some cool projects will come out of this as, as people start working with this data and look at you know, maybe comparing budgets or, you know, compared to the amount of federal aid that, that's available or maybe even consider where uh, future underinsurance could exist as these uh, sea levels rising and those um, floodplains are changing. I think there's a lot of really cool uses that can come from, from, this, um, from this data. And um, for me, future work, I think, uh, Again, we did cover every possible economic loss. I think there's additions that, that can be looked at into the future. Um, maybe looking at relationships between land use and economic losses and maybe using those relationships to model what a future development could, um, could be like and what the economic impact would be of future development. Um, we're also looking into doing some local case studies where we can utilize some local level data to enhance the assessments. And with that, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, the NOAA CCME, which is, um, has been part of my fellowship for throughout my dissertation, and of course, the, the NOAA Dynamic Sea Level Rise Assessment um, Project. And, and, and the team that I've been a part of. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much. Um, I am gonna ask you a quick question uh, while we are still on your presentation uh, from Renee. She's curious if all of the bars inside the hexagons are on the same scale for each map and data set. No, no, I think they each have their own scale. And uh, let me see if I can go back. Yeah. Okay, so here, for example, um, um, this is building losses, and this is uh, 74 million is sort of this, this size of a bar. While, what else do I have? Um, when I was looking at the total economic um, value here, um, 
again, because this is cumulative, you know, the, the VAT, maybe that same size bar actually is double. And, you know, these kinds of maps are, um, it was just one way to visualize so much data, uh, but yeah, it would be um, kind of cool to to make them all the same size for maybe for a report or something, a county report or something like that. Thank you so much, Deanna. So much great information. And um, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of us are foc focusing on the impacts to our natural resources, but the uh, the built infrastructure and the economic impacts are, are right there with us. Um, and, you know, especially when we're trying to communicate this information to our, our local communities. And um, so thank you so much for bringing that piece to our symposium. And, um, yeah. and speaking of communication, we have our uh, communicator extraordinaire up next <laughs> and, uh, and uh, bringing science to the people, <laughs> Ms. Renee. So um, Renee is going to yeah. close us out today and, and um, again, again demonstrate and, and show some of, some of the products that have come from these projects. Awesome, thank you so much. Hi everyone, I understand that I'm between y'all and asking all your questions and also between y'all and happy hours since it's Friday. So I'm gonna try and make this entertaining and speedy. Um, so I've had the pleasure to work with this team for uh, many years now and it's been great to see the science advancing but also getting an opportunity to integrate people who might use this science as it's progressing and then help develop those products with the people who could use it and the people doing the science simultaneously. And so I want to talk a little bit about what that has produced and some of the next steps along with some of the applications of these data, just to give you a very small snapshot into some of the potential of these data. So just to give you a sense of what I'm going to talk about specifically, you heard about sort of two projects that broadly encompass um, a bunch of great research. And out of this, there are sort of three things I'm going to talk about. First, you heard referenced by Dr. Hagen in terms of storm surge changes. Then you heard from Dr. Alizad about HydroMem, and then you heard from almost Dr. Del Angel about the economic impacts. And so I'm gonna to actually touch on each of these. So the first product I wanna tell you about is how we've been helping get this information about how floodplains may change moving forward into the hands of people who could use it. And so the primary platform that's been developed to service these data is geomsurge.org. I'm gonna actually give you a small demonstration of this. But first I wanna recognize two people, um, Christine Buckle and Lynn Balthus, who made this, right? Like they were really instrumental in turning this just simple data access portal into something that's really taken off and been highlighted several times as a really good example of how to do something like this. But to give you a sense of what's in this platform is first there's some background on the science you've heard a lot today about how awesome it is but that doesn't mean that everyone gets to sit through such a great symposium and so we want to make sure as people enter this platform they understand why this research is different and how it can provide more than what they may have gotten in other places then there's some options here you can actually look at what storm surge under katrina or dennis may look like under four different sea level rise scenarios so if katrina hit with you know, half a foot of sea or half a meter of sea level rise, what would that look like? You can also explore the maximum of maximums. As part of this work, there are actually 10 historic storms where they then put them all on top of each other. You can think of it as the mom of all storms, if you will, the maximum of maximums, where they took that deepest, you know, regardless of the, which storm, the deepest amount of water and patched them all together. And you can look at how that would change under four sea level rise scenarios. And then there's this 1% annual chance event floodplain under two sea level rise scenarios. And so these are data that are live in the platform you can explore, but you can also download all of the above plus some more. There's another eight storms, like I mentioned, and some other annual chance events. And so now that I introduced it, I'm actually gonna take you to it. So this is what the platform looks like when you get there. And so this first section is what I was talking about where it gives you an understanding of what this research project is and what it encompassed and the types of things that you could potentially do with this science from a high level perspective. A few things I wanna point out, there will always be text here and then graphics, maps, or you know, things to explain what's going on over on the right-hand side. 
And then here is actually your navigation bar, so you'll know where you're at within the story map. So if we scroll down, there's actually some more information here, some specifics about the modeling. And one of my favorite things is this pop out here, which does a great job, if you click on it, of showcasing the concepts behind the science. Those things that Dr. Hagen was explaining, you know, he showcased some of this as well, but this idea of how the shoreline changes, that the dynamic processes that are being captured in this work. As you continue, you can also see a little bit about those historic storms that I was talking about. And you can even hover over them and it tells you which storm and what year that it hit and what category it was. So now we get into what I call the good stuff, <laughs> which is the stuff that people are always curious about, which are the results, right? So I'm gonna take just a second to orient you to this page as well. So first you see here the title, this is surge by storm, so individual storms. And there's a new button here we haven't seen before, which is that you can download the data. So as I mentioned, this is a way to explore some of the data and have access to all of the data that came from this part of the project. And so over here are those four different sea level rise scenarios I was explaining about. So, right, so this is Hurricane Katrina and what Katrina would have looked like with 0.2 meters or a little less than a foot of sea level rise. And then again, Katrina with half a meter, Katrina with 1.2 meters, and Katrina with two meters. There is also the opportunity to view Dennis and what that looked like. And if you click over here, you can see there's a little hyperlink and it brings up what Dennis looked like. But there were 10 storms that were analyzed with these same sea level rise scenarios. So you can go to download those data if there's another storm that's more interesting to you. The other thing is that you can zoom in manually with this plus and minus button, but I'm pretty lazy. So I just like to go to this search bar and type in directly Apalachicola, Florida, and it takes me there. And all these other windows automatically follow it. You've got a scale here. And then there's different things that you can do here, some more explanations. So again, this is the storm by storm, looking at those 10 historic storms they used to develop this method. If you keep scrolling, you can go to storm surge by maximums. Like I talked about the mom of all storms, the maximum of maximums. It's the same orientation. You're looking at the moms under the different sea level rise scenarios. You have the ability to go and download these data. If you follow this, it'll get you to just for these, and then again, it has the same kind of information over here. So now to the final section, we have still water storm surge data. And so this is those annual percent chance, the 1% and the 0.2%, sometimes known as the 100 and 500 year events um, were calculated. And if you look in this window here, what you see there's only two and there's this slider bar. And so the data that are available to directly play with live in this platform are the 1% annual chance under the low scenario, which is 0.2 meters. And then if you pull it over in this side is the 1.2 meter scenario, also still that 1% annual chance. These are all the data that are here to explore live, but all of those same four sea level rise scenarios, plus the present day, the things that you saw Diana analyze, those are available if you go to download the data here, as are the 0.2%. So whether you're looking at how, you know, that regulatory 1% that people often talk about for like FEMA maps, now this is not FEMA maps, but that's sort of a reference point for the 1%, or if you're thinking about more extreme situations like the 0.2%, both of those are available. Again, you just go to download the data. And so that is what is available from the storm surge. There's also more of try this. There's even some critical facilities here, though it's not the same ones that we heard Diana talk about earlier. Hopefully that will change, but I'll talk about that in a bit. So that's one platform for how you can explore, understand the data a little bit better, and then download them directly. So this information helps people understand how the 1% and 0.2% annual chance area might change. As Diana mentioned, this is both in its range as well as its depth which is really important. Um, I've heard of some people thinking about freeboard and how they might take some of this into consideration. It also helps identify infrastructure that's at risk as well as considerations for future design. I'm gonna talk about an example of that here in a little bit. And then there's also the transportation evacuation routes that might be considered and how things might change moving forward. So now let's talk about Hydromem. This is what we heard Dr. Alizad talk about. 
And again, we have a platform for this because why not? Maps are great. And we had Christine and Lynn on our team making awesome things. And so this is at gommarsh.org. And so just to give you an understanding of what's in this platform before we go look at it, there is background on the modeling. There is marsh productivity and extent at 2100. And you can look at that at four different scenarios and at all three National Estuarine Research Reserves in the study area. And then you can also view time lapse of the marsh productivity and extent from 2000 to 2100. Again, you can see that for all three of the National Estuarine Research Reserves. And you can look at that under the almost four foot of sea level rise scenario. And it includes total marsh acreage and change. And so you can download all of the above, but in addition to that, you know, this time lapse that showed, you know, every five years across that time frame, that's available for all the other sea level rise scenarios as well. Well, for the higher ones, it's five years, and for the lower ones, it's every 20 years, but it's there. And so again, if you go to gommarsh.org, it'll take you to this beautiful picture actually from Apalachicola area. And again, you'll see over here on the left, you have information about the different mirrors and the work that was done. And then if you keep scrolling, there are several pages here that talk a little bit about this model. And as you heard from Green, there's several different factors to this. And so it steps you through each one. And again, there's this great graphic that talks through some of the dynamics of the model and how this is not just a standard static model. And so I'm not going to get into all of this because you just heard Kareem talk about it in a much more knowledgeable way, but it does step you through the marsh equilibrium portion of this and then how it was all put together with the ADSERC modeling to get you hydro mem. And then we start to get into, again, what I call the fun parts. <laughs> and so when it loads, you see here there's four panels. Just like before, this represents four different sea level rise scenarios. These blue lines are actually the modeling domain. The orange lines represent the NER, and all that information is over here on the left as well. And again, there's the three study areas, so you can drag all the way over if you'd like, or you can simply click on Apalachicola, Florida, and it will upload. And I should point out while it's loading that we have time steps that we talked about, and we'll see that in a minute, but this is at that end point at 2100. And then there's also these time-lapse videos. And so this is Grand Bay near, but as you can see here, the model results that gives you the year here. So this is 2040, 2045, and then it tells you specifically which sea level rise scenario that you're looking at. And so we can do the same thing for Apalachicola. It does take it a little bit longer because it's a little bit bigger file. There we go. So again, you can see here, it's stepping through the years and five year increments. And it's that way for the 1.2 and the two, and then you can also um, get it for every 20 years for the lower sea level rise rates. And then additionally, you can see visualizations of the change in total acreage over time. And it shows you here for each sea level rise scenario. So we were looking at the different ones. This is the, the largest one they did at two meters. And this is cycling over again back at 0.2 meters. <laughs> So a big difference. So the last thing I wanted to talk about, and you know, Diana already covered a lot of this, but there's the economic impact data. We don't have a live website for this, but we have been actively working on it for three years now um, through various phases of working at workshops like this one, back when we could all meet in person and be together. Um, we were looking specifically, as she described, at those impacts from the exacerbated storm surge under the 1% and the 0.2%. And the things we hope people will be able to see at a minimum out of the future platform are the number and value of damaged buildings, shelter needs and displaced people, roads, and critical facilities. And like I said, it's being co-developed. We've already had two really great input sessions with people where they got to explore the platform itself, as well as questions about the data and give us feedback on the best way to present it and you know which combinations of data would be the most compelling. And so what we'd like to do is combine the surge map that you saw, that geo and surge, with these data into a fluid platform that lets you access what from this project um, makes the most sense for you. And we're still working on what that's going to look like. So to give you a couple examples of how these data have been applied, um, one of the things that happened is we talked about you know that sort of relative change in future storm surge. 
And so there was a wastewater treatment facility in Jackson County, uh, Mississippi, that is being designed, it's new, and they wanted to understand if they were to protect their facility to a 0.2% annual chance event all the way out to 20, 2080, what that would look like. And they were using uh, six feet of sea level rise based on their risk tolerance and the local projections. And so that fit really closely with one of the scenarios that this team had done. And so we were able to look at that relative change and give them estimates for high, how, how high they might want to build a burn. And we actually went on to do a cost benefit analysis to see if that was still cost effective and it was. Another example is there is a um, community, Santa Rosa County, that has integrated both the future storm surge and the economic impacts data in a pilot program into a broader model they're using to help understand where to best focus their capital improvements planning and to help communicate with their constituents. And then this is actually integrated into a project done in Apalachicola, the future storm surge data. We put some maps together to help inform some of that floodproofing work that was being done there. And then uh, finally, you know, I can't tell you how many times we've just taken this out and talked to people, done road shows and, and town halls and let people play with these data just to raise community awareness that you know, the floodplains are changing and that as seas rise, it's you know, two different conversations. There's people who are used to it flooding, that it's gonna be a lot higher in their area or people who've never had to worry about it, it's suddenly being a problem. And then just a couple other things, if you wanna run with these data, we'd love for that to happen. Um, one thing that might help you is we have a video, it's a five minute short video that helps um, explain some of this science and how sea level rise is gonna impact storm surge in our area. It's specific to the Northern Gulf, and you can see that link there. Uh, we also have our website um, for my program, the Sentinel Site Cooperative, where we can just generally help you with having conversations about this, understanding the data, or helping get it applied or integrated into projects. Um, and then I just put this here so you can reach out to me. There's a whole bunch of us who work on this out of my office. Um, and we've been trying to get this stuff rolling for a while. So we, uh, we're happy to jump in with what we know and help move things forward. And so with that, I uh, just wanted to say thank you. I think now we're gonna move into a moderated session. Um, but yeah, so that's a little bit about what can be done with these data, what has been done with these data. And just, I'm excited to keep working on it. Thanks so much, Renee. That was a great overview and a great way to wrap up the session and, and the day. Um, I would invite uh, the other speakers to, to join us and the, the big heads on the screen. And um, so, so far, I just see some, some comments. Um, we'll let folks add in some questions and, um, and uh, we'll go from there. Um, so, First were some uh, accolades about the animations in the slides. Uh, we had uh, one audience member say, I really like how on the storm surge um, uh, animation that the car changes to show how to, as time goes on. And um, so really appreciate it. And, um, and actually Renee commented on Deanna's about your, uh, some of your animations and, and uh, cartoons. And, so fantastic there. Um, and it's always amazing to me um, when you've got those really effective communication tools, um, how widely they are used and, and, um, and passed on. And um, I believe that Davina created one of those original animations yeah. I, and I, uh, I appreciate her creativity. Yeah, within Deanna's paper, I think Scott has the background on where the, the original graphics came from. Mm -hmm. That's great stuff. Uh, we had a comment about uh, Kareem's presentation, great presentation. And uh, I have a comment from uh, Mike Sterick, and uh, he was complimenting uh, Deanna. And he said, I have some questions about has this modeling approach, but he will catch up with you either on campus or at um, some, some other time in the future, because um, he had to sign off. Um, so very exciting. Uh, it was wonderful to learn about all the different research going on, uh, very eye-opening. Uh, so let's see, I have a question now. Uh, have you worked with public health officials on some of the impacts from storms um, for emergency planning purposes? Um, I'm not sure if we've had public health officials. I know we've had um, a couple of stakeholder 
uh, meetings um, in Apalachicola and Apalachicola uh, and um, when we were in Pascagoula as well. Um, I'm not sure of all the attendees, but um, not, not that I know of. Is there a second part of that question? Or um, aside from um, essential facilities, is there another concern that would be of interest with with public health? Um, and I'll add, we have had EMAs um, either that I've reached out to, worked with directly, letting them know these data existed, um, and then about when the, some of the stuff from Diana started coming out, when they weren't able to make it in person to our meetings, and then we've had um, some, a couple of EMAs actually come to the stakeholder workshops. So that's only been like one or two across the years. And no health specifically. Mm -hmm. And then a byproduct of the work that we've done in the model development has been the extension of the model to a real-time forecasting capability. And that product has been used, the uh, CERA tool, Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment tool, has been used in that capacity, particularly to assess potential vulnerabilities with respect to public health. Yeah, and I recommend CERA all the time. It's great. Can you spell out the acronym? I'm sorry. C. E R A. Okay. Coastal Emergency Risk Assessment. Thank you. Thank you. If you do L S U C E R A, you'll find it on Google. Okay. And then we have a follow up uh, question Do you see how this might fit into evacuations, public works, disease? and mosquito control. And uh, Renee, you talked a little bit about how um, the the one example of the, the water treatment facility uh, utilizing the, the, day, the modeling. Yeah, we've had some conversations um, and that's usually a, what this helps really simulate at this point um, is conversations with different utilities and water management groups um, around risks. So we often talk about outfalls, and then recently we've been talking about water at surface elevation coming to a point where all these gravity-fed wastewater systems can't discharge <laughs> during storm events and other things. And um, you know, things like the wastewater treatment facility being built is a you know that's not that common. That's a humongous undertaking. Um, but simulating conversation about risks and vulnerabilities, lift station, making sure that pieces of the infrastructure are still working as those changes have definitely um, been progressing across the region because of these data. Excellent, thank you. Sorry, I'm trying to check all my multiple question boxes and... <laughs> I have a comment here from Jason Garwood. No question, I just wanna say that it's good to see social science studies like this and we need more of these. Uh, that was during Diana's. Yeah, well, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. I just had one more comment and or question, uh, actually for Kareem. Um, one thing that we've talked about here is um, we have expansive marshes, but we also have expansive uh, forested wetlands and understanding the dynamics between the two and, and how migration may happen. And, um, I think that's that's kind of future work for HydroMem, correct? Or something that you're considering? Uh, yeah, actually the, the line between the swamps and um, and marshes are, are something that is constantly changing in the sea level rise will force it. Um, so there are, there are several things um, going on. One is, um, sea level rise and water level and um, how much the elevation of those swamps help marsh to migrate um, up and and then the salinity level um, which move marsh um, further inland so um, yeah they are both both important and um, that's another thing that we are considering to add to 
the hydroman. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me go back and see if uh, I don't know if I see any more questions. Is that spot uh, lost the internet? Oh no. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised that he's the only one over two days, honestly. <laughs> it's been kind of a miracle. Uh, well, let me do one more scan on the Padlet. Um, people are adding comments and and um, and uh, questions there, and so I would recommend if um, any of the audience members or um, any of the folks that have presented today, if you uh, would like to comment or ask questions about any of the presentations that you heard, uh, please feel free to. Um, add them to the Padlet and we'll do our best to, to get them on to the correct person. And um, I wanted to just say a big thank you again to to all of you guys and and um, and Scott and Absentia and <laughs> uh, so appreciate uh, all of your hard work. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've been lucky to be part of it over the last many years and um, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to share it, continue sharing it broadly and, and trying to bring more people into the fold. So uh, we'll end there. Uh, the symposium over the last two days has been recorded and uh, we will send a follow-up email to all of the participants uh, with a link to the recording. And um, trying to think if I'm, am I forgetting anything, Kennedy? <laughs> you let me know. Oh yeah, yeah. Poor Scott. Um, so I think we're going to wrap up for the day. And again, I appreciate everybody for attending. And uh, I'm very happy about how, how everything went. And uh, and um, one last thing. Sorry, I'm getting. Okay multiple things um how are we how are we doing okay so there will be one additional email to our, all of the participants and panelists uh, that will contain a survey about the symposium and uh we we absolutely would like to uh, hear your feedback on how it went on from your perspective and uh what we were missing and maybe what we could do better for next time and and um uh, certainly appreciate any constructive criticism. So thank you all for attending and uh, we will see you soon. Thanks, Jenna, this was awesome. Bye. Bye, thank you all. Bye.